videos for our video library. Uh, the, if you can send us videos, not just of complications, but of basic procedures, uh, we need instructional videos, which the juniors can log in and see them. So please, my request to all of you. Without wasting any more time, I'm going to request Imran to introduce the uh, uh, moderators. Please, Imran. Uh, sir, so much thanks. And now uh, we are going to start our this session, GLR sum up session. GLR, this is sum up session of revisional bariatric surgeries. In this session, uh, so we have moderators, Professor Asim Shabir, we have Professor Nasir Sakran, we have Professor Khalid Gawad, and Dr. Tansir. And I request to Professor Asim Shabir, please lead this uh, uh, session as a leading moderator. Please, sir. Uh, Asim, can you do me a favor? Before you start, just introduce the panelists, panelists as well, please. Hold on. Thanks. A very good evening to everybody. Um, uh, morning to somebody and good afternoon to the others. Uh, it Anyway, what is good is everything is good. So that's the more important thing out of it. Uh, thanks very much uh, for the honor, Professor Amir and Imran. Um, I'm honored to be here uh, as one of the moderators. Uh, I have an esteemed panel of experts today. Uh, first of all, Allah Abbas Mustafa uh, will be joining us from Egypt. Uh, and I understand that Allah Abbas is here. Uh, then uh, Dr. Professor... Kerman Sarawi, uh, he is also here. He's the editor of the journal as we just got introduced uh, by Imran. Uh, we do hope to see Mufazal Lakhdawala uh, from India. Uh, I hope he can join us soon. Uh, Professor Bruno uh, would un be unable to join us uh, here. Uh, Professor Arun Parsad, uh, uh, I don't see Arun at the moment, but I do hope he turns up in at some point in time. Chetan from UK. Uh, and then uh, I see my friend uh, Gurvinder Singh uh, Jamun. He is here. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you for coming in. Uh, delight to have you. And then further than me, there's only one person on the line who I can see. That's Professor Weijia Lee from Taiwan. We are in the same time zone. So, sir, I'll make it easy for everybody. So, thanks, everybody, for joining this great uh, revisional uh, bariatric surgery seminar. Uh, and to the other um, experts who are in, I may call upon uh, you as well. So, I see uh, Dr. Rajay, Dr. Kular looking into the camera. Very handsome. So, thank you very much. All right, so I get this, uh, I, I will get this forum started and I'll get uh, Dr. Imran Abbas as he's one of the moderators to ask the first question from the uh, experts who are available. And then we'll just go couple, we, we've had about six questions that we've lined up for the experts to try and see if we can come to a consensus. So Imran, would you mind taking up the first question with our experts? Sir, uh, so much thanks, definitely. It's a great honor to be here as a moderator in such a great academic activity. My question from Professor V. J. Lee. Sir, how you define failure of bariatric surgery? Injury is, as patient has we regain from bottom 10 to 20%, most important is the patient has good motivation and we can find some anatomical defect we can fix. And also the patient have a comorbidity come back. I think this is a good indication for a revision surgery. Okay. Yes. Thank you, sir. Professor Alabas, can you add anything in this definition? Uh, Professor Alabas, can you hear me? Yes, uh, I'm, with you. I'm with you, Imran. <laughs> Yeah, I think uh, Professor uh, Wajiri uh, covered it nicely. Uh, I think uh, we have to define the failure uh, and divide it into two types of failure. Uh, primary failure with the patient did not reach his goal or uh, rec recurrence of obesity after uh, primary success, then the patient regained because there is some difference in the management plan, whether this is a patient is failed from the beginning 
or had a an, an, uh, success for two or three years and then regained weight again. So, okay, we also have Professor Jammu. Professor uh, Jammu, uh, so what is your experience and how you can define failure of bariatric surgery? Uh, Professor, Dr. Jammu, you un need to unmute yourself, sorry. Okay. Yeah. First of all, thank you, Dr. Imran, for inviting me on your show and uh, greetings from India to everyone. Well, uh, uh, you know that uh, what we call as a failure of uh, bariatric surgery is either it is some weight regain or it is some insufficient weight loss or it is some uh, recurrence of comorbidities. Any of these factors uh, attribute to the failure of bariatric surgery. So we know that there are so many definitions if you Google them, but the most acceptable one by everyone, I think we follow the reinforced criteria where 50% of excess weight loss at 18 months is considered to be a successful weight loss surgery and anything less than is either failure or intermediate results. So either it is a weight regain or insufficient weight loss or the reoccurrence of comor comorbidities, I would say, uh, is uh, uh, that uh, there is need for some attention to the towards this uh, bariatric surgery patients. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, also, we will discuss later about this. Uh, we have Kirman Sarabi. Kirman, you are with us. Kirman, can Good you afternoon. hear me? Good afternoon. Hello to all friends. Thanks for having me. Yes, uh, Kirman, same question. How you define failure of bariatric surgery. So because if we define, there are some def definition that is already mentioned as professor also mentioned about. So uh, so what is, what's your experience? And when you will go for surgical intervention? So just imagine if there is insufficient weight loss. So patient, so uh, someone did a uh, sleeve gastrectomy that was not standard sleeve and there was a wide pouch and after three, four months, patient stuck to weight loss, just patient lost 20%, 30% of excess body weight. And now again, start to gain weight when you will go for intervention, surgical intervention or no, still you will try your best to go for medication and also uh, MDT. What is your protocol? As first, we should define the uh, failure in bariatric surgery. You can divide it into uh, weight, uh, weight loss problems, such as uh, um, incomplete weight loss, that we define it uh, usually as uh, the failure to achievement of BMI uh, below uh, 35 in um, one year on, or one and a half year or uh, total weight loss percent uh, below 20% uh, in one year. It's uh, the definition of uh, weight loss failure. Uh, and for weight regain, when a, pa when a patient uh, has weight regain more than 20% uh, uh, that uh, he or she lost it before, or BMI more than uh, 35. These definitions, uh, is for the patients that are in uh, class three obesity. You know that for more uh, uh, BMIs, uh, such as the patients with BMI more than 50 and 60, uh, failure to achievement of uh, a BMI one class lower may be defined as a uh, weight loss failure. And another uh, reason for uh, uh, revision or redo surgery is uh, um, not achievement uh, in improvement or uh, remission of comorbidities or recurrence of comorbidities after primary response to bariatric surgery. Uh, for, um, for all of the reason, um, the patient should be evaluated by a multidisciplinary team um, to, um, to choose if a patient is a good uh, candidate for revisional surgery or not. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. I think we should. Yeah. Welcome. 
please please uh, i think uh, we should we should do full evaluation by multidisciplinary team such as nutritional evaluation and then uh, we should look for uh, um, anatomical uh, anatomical abnormalities in first procedure as you said as incomplete gastrectomy or other reason or uh, the complications may be occur after the first uh, or primary bariatric surgery. Thank you, sir. So we have Professor Chitan. He's also a scholar. And uh, also, we, we are interested to hear from uh, Chitan. So what is your ex personal experience and also definition by the data? Uh, Professor Chitan. I think your signal is breaking down. Trying to get into the range, so I'll, I'll answer one uh, range of my Wi-Fi. So I don't know whether you can hear. Pardon me, Imran. Just keep now, now we can hear you. Now yeah, we can that's hear. what I'm trying to say. I'm not in a good patch. Uh, so it. it uh, it's okay. Uh, we'll, we'll get you back on the line, Chetan, when, when you are more settled with the Wi-Fi. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll take this uh, from here, Imran, if that's all right. So uh, thank you very much. Can I, can I just go around the table here and ask, do we actually know how do we define successful weight loss? We're trying to be very harsh on ourselves. Can I go around the table and listen from the experts? Do we have a consensus on what surgical success. Let's forget about procedure. What's the bare minimum threshold for weight and comorbidity resolution? Have we as a community been able to decide what is success? Uh, can I just go around the table? Amir, can you, Professor Amir, can you take the first uh, bite and say yes or no? And if you have a strong opinion, let me know what you yeah, think. I think... I think it's 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 a difficult. It's it has to be. It's a it's it's not. There's no fixed uh, definition for it, right? Okay. It is very much. Uh, it's a relative term, and it depends on individual patients. The patients come to you not just for weight loss. There are different reasons why they come to you. So I think you need to judge it as a holistic uh, approach rather than just stick to the numbers. But do you think we should put a range somewhere so to uh, work for weight for comorbidities in different aspects or that's not possible to come out? I with? think, Asim, uh, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a, something we might find an answer sometime. But if you look around, there are arbitrary figures like at least 50% of excess weight loss, right, is considered to be a success. Similarly, in comorbidities, we talk about it either complete resolution or at least improvement in them, right? So it, it, as I said earlier, I don't think we can, we will be able to give an exact number onto it. That's my experience over the years. Thanks, uh, thanks Professor Amir on that. Uh, Dr. Mark, can I have your comments? Would you like to comment on the same? So you gotta unmute yourself if you don't mind. Okay, so your question is, what is an optimal weight loss? Is that correct? Yes, absolutely correct. Okay, well, I think it's, 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 it's as Professor Khan said, it's very difficult because it, depend, it depends not only on figures, but also what the, the patient expects from your surgery. And, and well, what he finds or she finds um, uh, a good result. But as I said, normally we say, okay, if you have um, a 50% weight loss, it's a good result. And uh, what about resolution of comorbidities? Well, let's say that you have at least a remission. Do we have to, uh, have to, do we have to define it as a 100% 
resolution of comorbidities. I don't know, but it's 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 very difficult to to set a standard uh, on what is an excellent weight loss or what is optimal weight loss, in my opinion. Thank you very much. And I think most of the expert panels uh, would not have any differing opinion here that this is kind of a fluid situation. Most people would take 50% and above as a success, but comorbidities will, will not agree with each other uh, as to how to benchmark the best outcomes. So we'll move on in this discussion. And my question to uh, Dr. Jammu is, uh, if you do get these patients with weight regain, so we're not talking about failure to lose weight or comorbidities, but patients who've lost to your optimal expectations and regain. How would you kind of evaluate these patients in your practice? Sorry, uh, Dr. Jamu, you also muted. You might want to unmute yourself, please. Yeah. So with the, so much experience into bariatric surgery, I think we all are experiencing, we are getting bad, our patients with the problems of weight regain and uh, the reoccurrence of comorbidities. So the strategies that uh, uh, I think uh, there are some set of patients, we know that if we see the literature that they report more to us uh, with weight regain issues. If I give you the example, uh, patients like uh, who have some um, mental issues like uh, binge eating habits or other things, they would always report to us with weight regain. We, whatever we may counsel them, again, after a few months or a few years of surgery, they would start eating more. We have seen with our experience. And uh, sometimes uh, even literature has reported that uh, surgery was taken, surgery has taken longer time to operate a particular patient, maybe due to the technical reasons. Those patients have reported back with the incidence of weight regain for unknown reasons, probably I don't know. Uh, maybe the surgery went wrong or sometimes. So, there's nothing to argue about that patients of weight regain are there and the literature supports that it is as high as about 30 to about 76% incidence of weight regain is there. So I think uh, it has to be uh, a multi uh, team who should be involved because some patients or whom we know that they are going to report to us, I think they should be followed up more seriously. Although we know that there is challenges, there are limitations, patients are lost to follow up, they will not come to you and they will forget the uh, advices what we have given to them at the time or before the surgery or the dietary and all things. But these are the patients, uh, these are the challenging patients. So the options we are left with them is when they come with weight regain is, I think first of all, uh, by all means, diet is the fundamental basis. Though we know that diet doesn't reverse the weight regain, whatever you do, but diet is still, I think, they form the fundamental basis of any successful bariatric surgery. So patient has to be counseled. I think now we have so many medicines, pharma and drugs coming into it, and that is helping a lot. And the patients who actually need a revision surgery for weight regain, though the incidence of uh, bypass surgeries or the malabdoc of the optic surgeries undergoing uh, revision surgeries less than the restrictive surgeries, but yes, there is some hope for the patients who have failed, failed their primary surgeries, they can be revised into other surgeries. For example, sleeve being revised to some uh, RYGB or MGB or AGB procedure or SADES procedures. So there are some other things we can convert those patients into. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I'll go to uh, Mohammed Hissam. Hissam. Would you, in your practice, if you don't mind, uh, could you elaborate how would you work these patients with weight regain and what would your advice be to the juniors listening to this uh, as to what should they do? But if you allow me just to um, make a small comment on the <laughs> definition of uh, the, the uh, you call it a failure, and I'm, I'm a bit... Uh, Yani against calling fa failure of bariatric surgery. Uh, you know, this is a chronic, complex, genetic, environmental, hormonal uh, problem that we cannot uh, treat with our surgery. So we should understand that surgery is just a tool. And the, uh, as you mentioned, and our colleagues, that the multidisciplinary approach with the follow-up for a lifetime may help us in getting the best 
outcome in terms of excess weight, and we should call it weight regain or weight recurrence rather than failure. Uh, as for the approach for weight regain, um, it depends on the primary surgery. We know that most of the surgeries done uh, nowadays are sleeves. So um, for me, and I'm, uh, I'm always prone to go for malabsorption, to adding malabsorption. I don't go for restriction after restriction. So if I have a patient with the sleeve, uh, first I will do an endoscopy just to assess the hiatus if he had any um, uh, uh, esophagitis. Then the decision will go either for a stomosis gastric bypass if the patient don't have any uh, uh, esophagitis or for a long uh, limb, BP limb row gastric bypass, this is my approach for sleeve. Um, we are st we st I started to have um, some weight regain after one anastomosis gastric bypass also. So uh, what I'm doing for these patients actually is uh, prolongation of the BP limb, uh, one third BP limb, two third uh, common channel, and with adding restriction to the um, uh, origin to the stomach. Uh, this is my approach for weight regain after one anastomosis gastric bypass. Thank you very much. Thanks. Um, I, I'll move on to Arun. Uh, Arun, thank you for joining us. Uh, Arun, your comments on how should somebody who manages patients with uh, weight loss surgery know about and know about weight regain? And how would you interrogate these patients in your practice? <clears throat> right. So I think for this one important thing is that we should have a very good follow-up system and whereby we follow up the patients by mail, by phone calls, by messages and something nice which we developed during the COVID times is to develop a WhatsApp group and an online support group meeting. So our success of keeping patients in the loop has gone up ever since we started this online support group uh, process whereby we get the people to join in because physically to come for a support group meeting, people lose enthusiasm. And if the patient is in touch with us constantly, then one can you know guide them the moment you see that there is any deviation. People who have come back with rate regain are mostly people who are not coming up for regular follow-ups. So when they come, we need to assess not only their dietary habits, but also look for deficiencies. We have also noticed that the deficiency correction and the process of nutrition re-implementation quite often puts them back on track with the uh, weight process. And uh, one last comment, I fully agree with uh, uh, the uh, with Mohammed when he says that we should not use the term failure. And I always use the term relapse, just like all our other medical specialties use. When the cancer comes back, it's not failure of chemotherapy. When the coronary stent gets blocked, it's not failure of the stent. When the joint gets damaged after joint replacement, you don't call it failure. So why should we use the term failure when it comes to bariatric surgery? So that just, I just also want to stress on that point, which the previous speaker made. Thanks, Arun. Thank you. Uh, point valid and well taken uh, that it is actually not a failure. It's probably a relapse and that relapse could be due to non-compliance to advice provided, uh, altered physiology, which continues to remain uh, unchanted and continues to change the patient and tweak the patient back to his original state. Thank you very much for those comments. I'll move on to Professor Vijay Lee. Uh, Professor Vijay Lee, what, um, what would you consider as indications to perform revisional surgery? So if somebody uh, starts with, say, 40 BMI, goes to 32 uh, BMI and has not lost enough weight, so failure to lose enough, 
would that be uh, indication beyond complication and weight regain? What are your indications? Could you enlighten us? Thank you. I think my indication is more stress on the anhedonic defect. So usually I will look at about the anhedonic defect of the patient. Can I fix anything? And it's a reasonable and it's supported by evidence. For example, if we see a dilated gastric pouch, either by sleeve or by a blue IGB or OAGB, then probably we can do so something. And the next is, can we extend the BPD longer? So this is the two point that I always think about. So if we have some clear anatomic defect, we can fix. This is probably is the most important for surgical revision. Otherwise, if patient have a quite good anatomy for bariatric surgery, then we can seek seek for other treatment option. Now we have a many drug endoscope treatment or something. Yes, yeah, so this is my opinion. Yes. Uh, thank you, Professor Vijeli. Yeah, point well taken. So you would use any abrasions in anatomy, whether they are complications or inadequately performed procedures as your benchmark to provide a revisional surgery option to a patient. And not simply that if the anatomy of the originally designed procedure is correct, you would not yes. uh, offer surgery, but you would go to other medical modalities, lifestyle, and find something which can help the patient better. Uh, that 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 that's a that's a good way of putting exactly. it. Thank you very yes. much, uh, Doctor Mohammad uh, Karman Sara. Uh, could you comment on your choices and indications? Um, I think uh, the weight regain, uh, uh, recurrence of comorbidities, and uh, failure to, or incomplete weight loss. It's, it's better to say incomplete weight loss and the complications uh, after primary surgery, such as severe GERD after a stiff gastrectomy or um, persistent bi-reflex after OAGB can be um, indications for revisional surgery. Okay. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, Aysem, any comments? Um, uh, concerning bile uh, reflux after one anastomosis gastric bypass, um, we know that uh, when we look at the studies that the uh, rate is around 3 to 4 percent. I'm now doing a study uh, five to seven years after one anastomosis. I will, uh, will have the uh, final outcome within six months. And uh, as far as I can see that uh, there is... Uh, an element of Barrett's in my one anastomosis patients in the range of five to 10% after five to seven years. So um, I think that um, all our bariatric procedures um, may have reflux in a way or another. Even if you look at the room and wide gastric bypass, you will find that there is a lot of patients who uh, who have erosive gastritis. If you look at the study by Barham Budaya, 15% uh, they have severe erosive uh, esophagitis. So um, we should uh, explain to our patient that when having bariatric surgery, uh, the issue of reflux is a problem, but the, the problem will not come from our procedure. We know that 50% of the patients who have morbid obesity have already reflux and they have Barrett's and 0.5% and esophagitis and 3 to 4%. So it is very important that the issue of reflux is approached when consenting the patient, whether we do sleeve one anastomosis or room or gastric bypass. Thank you very much. Um, uh, while I wait to hear from Chetan with his back and he can hear us well, I'll just go to Professor Manana Gogol. Um, would you kindly help me comment on what do you think is critical in revisional surgery. Um, hello, 
everybody. It's uh, my honor to participate in this great meeting. So, um, in my opinion, uh, there are complex uh, situations because um, um, we are listening to these great uh, experts here and uh, all of us agree that uh, this uh, uh, is really um, just uh, in uh, how to say that important uh, how we just are uh, taking patient and uh, making also all follow up uh, and uh, uh, those things what uh, we are just um, individually taking from um, interview then uh, check up and everything we are making decision with the patient and uh, all these uh, sometimes are giving uh, this uh, uh, less uh, effectiveness. And um, that's why this sum up is so important that in my opinion, uh, we have to also consider somehow not only operation and procedure, but uh, um, follow up with the nutritionist uh, and um, dietologist who have to give a really uh, important advices how to behave after and uh, their uh, behavior have to be also taken of, under consideration with the psychiatrist or psychologist who really have to help them to take this big challenge after the operations because uh, sometimes they even not um, uh, assume uh, how big changes are after this uh, long um, um, run of the situation, what uh, um, really are different from their habits and their lifestyle. So thank you for just giving me and allowing me to just uh, say my opinion. But again, uh, I just um, um, try thank to- Thank you for as uh, much appreciated. Yeah, that Professor was a Asim, yes. yeah, Professor Asim, I have uh, just uh, a comment about failure of bariatric surgery. And uh, in my opinion, this is the best uh, forum uh, to define. So because this is a good point from Hesam and Aaron. So uh, failure, uh, we, can, we can replace the word of failure in future. Uh, so we cannot ask this is the failure. Uh, can you conclude this one? In my opinion, this is this session and sum up session. One of our target is same like this. So in future, so uh, so this word is not good as a failure. Are you agree? So uh, so Imran, I I think most of the people it is about nomenclature. Uh, it's like saying people are obese versus people with obesity and not talking about obesity, but talking about fatness. This is about higher intellectual thinking, and it's about how you use the words, right? So yes, relapse is an appropriate thing. Um, there are words that are used wrongly, uh, and yes, we can look at it in the word relapse, but is that how the international community views it in, in publications will make a difference? And that should be something that should be pushed for uh, to appropriately put up nomenclature for what is weight relapse and uh, uh, others uh, like this. Okay, sir, please. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I think we move on to a next interesting topic and I like to call upon uh, uh, Dr. Javed. Dr. Javed, I see your iPhone uh, is camera switched off. If I may request you to put it on. Uh, would you, would you, uh, I, I, my next question will be addressed to many of you in the audience, and this would be about what are some of the technical considerations you would keep in mind for patients who are going to have uh, a revisional surgery? I will start with uh, Dr. Javed. I'll go to Allah Abbas Mustafa next, and then we'll move on there. Dr. Javed, thank you for joining us. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Good afternoon. Good evening, everyone. Uh, good to see my friends. Um, the technical considerations, I think I'll be brief. Um, we all assume that the patient has gone through 
our multidisciplinary team, the dietetic assessment. Um, increasingly, I'm more aware of the usefulness of medication for weight regain. And I think the relative, if, um, uh, if the medication aspect has been looked at, then the definition of the anatomy and the patient's dietary behavior, their ability to consume protein post-surgery, and their ability to afford and take supplements post-surgery. They become very important considerations, especially in era of health tourism. We can do a very malabsorptive operation and leave the patient with multitude of problems. So technically, if there is a big pouch, a hiatus hernia, then the decision-making becomes relatively easy towards more of a ruin wire reconstruction. Uh, whereas if there are no hiatal problems, then the, we are open to either one anastomosis bypass or a SADIS procedure. Uh, but again, in all of this, I have to see how my patient is going to react to the procedure. Um, and the success to me um, for weight regain surgery is a relative success. For someone who's come down from 190 to 80, uh, to 110, um, and then they've gained 40 kg, we just have to see how the patient would define success and what we are aiming for. So I think it's a complex issue, but the basics are looking at the overall patient behavior, uh, their ability to cope with the demands of the operation that you're going to offer. So that's my summary of thoughts at this stage. Thank you very much, Dr. Javed. Uh, Professor Ala Abbas, over to you. Uh, it's nice to have a chance to share in this uh, very nice meeting. Uh, I'll talk about the technical points from the surgical point of view. You've already decided what you are going to do and you've uh, gone uh, through the, all the preparation, the anatomical and to, uh, through the steps. I think we have to be careful with the uh, technique itself because the revisional procedures are more prone, as we all know, for complications. So we need to make sure that the center is equipped for the, such a kind of surgery. The surgeon is, is trained enough and we have to respect the vascularity. So I think with the advent of the ICG, we have to rely on more and more about checking the uh, vascularity of certain small pouches after repeated applications of staplers and repeated surgery and dissection, which can devascularize areas. We have also to make sure that the team, the surgeon's uh, team, are uh, quite confident and comfortable in doing hand-sewn anastomosis, which is in many cases more reliable in thick tissues than <coughs> staplers. And if you are going to use staplers, you have to have the uh, reasonable uh, sized uh, staples uh, that can uh, match the tissue thickness uh, in revisional surgery. So I think, the, in my opinion, these technical surgical points are crucial to minimize the complications and to achieve the desired result. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Alabas. That was really a good, nice look into technical uh, details. Professor Weijie Lee, um, back to you. What are some of your technical considerations in revisional bariatric surgery? Uh, what do you look at beyond uh, the conservative therapy? My experience is for way we gain revision, there's a more important to find a restriction back than bypass the intestine loop. I have seen some fair revision surgery most of them are thinking if they can add in some uh, malabsorption, then they can have a good result. They forget to trim the gastric pouch. So for my my experience, I think the most important thing, you always need to think about how can you find back the restriction for a patient. Either, I think so I, so I prefer the long Gastric tube like OAGB or, or SARC, even in revision, I always need to trim the pouch. 
I think it's a very important in revision for very regain surgery. Yes, I only raised this point. Yes, thank you. Oh, thank you. So I like I like the debate here on the thinking the other way around. Most surgeons would start thinking about increasing limb length, making it more malabsorptive. And what I'm hearing from Professor Vijay Lee is totally three. 180 degrees opposite, which is you want more restriction. Uh, and the, is there anybody in the audience who shares the same thoughts as Professor Vijayli that uh, in a revisional surgery, we need to reintroduce restriction more than malabsorption? Well, um, I will uh, give you my humble experience when um, I started to convert sleeve gastrectomy to an anastomosis gastric bypass. Um, uh, I started to have some patients that did not have a good weight loss uh, when we do the regular one anastomosis with rest, um, restriction with 180 centimeters. So I believe that maybe I agree with Dr. Wajiri that restriction is very important, but I think is uh, that um, adding more on the BP limb is as much important as the restriction itself. So what I did for the uh, what I do for the revisions is I do a total small bowel length count and then I bypass one third of the uh, small bowel. Yeah, Dr. Asim, we cannot hear you. Sorry, I muted myself. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Isam. That was really useful. So I think it's about creating that balance back of restriction and malabsorption and adding probably on top that man uh, malabsorption. Thank you, that was a real nice comment back there. Uh, Arun, your thoughts? Sorry, Arun, you muted like me. Yeah, hi. So, you know, that's an interesting concept about adding restriction in patients who've had a failed bypass and personally I do not have any uh, experience in that because I have never tried that. The only thing we have tried is that some patients who have had weight regain after an RYGB where the pouch has got dilated, the anastomosis has got dilated, we have stitched the uh, anastomosis using the endosurgery device but uh, unfortunately i would say that we've not had great success in uh, preventing the weight regain and leading these patients to weight loss thank you arun thank you that that that's really uh, nice and uh, thanks for those comments <coughs> professor lauren <coughs> layani would you wish to show yourself and some comments on it I'm not sure whether he's... Re yeah, there we go. Yes, I am. Thank you very much. Would you want to share some of the technical considerations you may have when doing revisional bariatric surgery or prescribing one? Sorry, you're muted. Would you mind unmuting yourself? Can't hear you. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you now. And you can see... Yes, I can see you. So, what do you want me to try to tell you? What uh, my consider? What, what tell me uh, again? What are your technical considerations? What would you technically consider when offering a revisional surgery? What runs through your mind for a patient, and what runs through for the patient and for yourself as well? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Uh, well, I I think uh, the uh, uh, what's come from my mind is uh, number one is the uh, the uh, the happiness or not happiness of the patient. What the patients uh, 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 ah I lost your I lost your face. Come back to me, sir. We are better here. Better to see you, sir. We are here. Yeah. No, I I think I think it's one thing is what the patients wish uh, in terms of uh, expectations, happiness, uh, weight regain or not enough weight. Number two, as uh, uh, G. Lee have said correctly, 
is if there is any anatomical issues, the most common operation, the most common problem now we see maybe once a week I revise is uh, the, the fell sleeve. And most of the fell sleeve you find they have a, a hiatal hernia, you have a migration in the chest, they have a, a, a dodgy sleeve, the sleeve has been done badly, they have a, they have a, a dog, uh, a, a kind of a champagne bottle. So everything anatomically, you 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 know you you're going to be able to 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 repair. I think it's it's also a, 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 a important consideration. Number three, you need and the question was very accurate from my friend from Singapore. You need to be safe. Safetyness is crucial. It you need to make sure the patient is going to be safe. And uh, uh, if uh, uh, if you uh, are uh, uh, technically uh, able to go inside the chest and do everything and repair. If you're not, I think is what I do when I do my, my as you know, Abbas, when I do my uh, my training fellowship, it's better to refer the patient because uh, uh, revisions can be extremely complicated uh, sometimes, sometimes. And so you, this is what comes from my mind. And uh, uh, um, if the patient has... Uh, uh, let's say uh, five or ten kilo weight regain after a sleeve, like you can see of this UAE patient, little princess coming to see you and say, oh, you know, uh, I have a sleeve, my BMI was 36, now I'm 32, and I'm a little bit bigger, blah, blah, blah. I don't reoperate this patient. There's no way. I mean, you, you need to also need to say no. Uh, but if uh, half of the sleeve, like for example, in the next uh, in in Oxford, I'm going to discuss. Uh, this is going to be my topic about sleeve versus sleeve to MGB versus sleeve to against uh, Rui gastric bypass. If half of the sleeve is in the chest, if uh, is a huge uh, 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 bubble uh, uh, of the sleeve, is the sleeve cause some symptoms? Most of the patients will have some regurgitations reflux which often come as well as a weight regain all this it's a it's very much an anatomical and i think jay lee is right if you can repair the anatomy at least you got a win which operation i'm going to do me is very simple my practice we have a rules i do uh all my sleeve to mgb except for uh barrett's esophagus with re-sleeve and and or not repair of a hernia and elongated the limb. That's all. So I make a sleeve and I can also teach revision. So you need to have a safe operation. So far, interestingly enough, I have zero leak on any of my revision sleeve to MGB. I have few on my primary. Obviously, we all have some. But... Um, uh, yes, the, the, uh, this has come from my mind, uh, through my mind. I, 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 uh, uh, the, the revision bound to something is finished now. This is what I used to do, and then it's a pass because it's almost no bound anymore. And now if you have a patient which come for uh, Rui gastric bypass for revision, then this is a bit more complicated, and we can, I can, I'm happy to to talk about this a little bit later because you need to find a way to 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 for a solution for the patient. But this is what I do in my practice, and uh, it works very well. So so far, I'm happy and I'm safe. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for that very nice insight <clears throat> into your choice of procedure. Now I'm going to put this question to all of the panelists. And it, I would just go one by one through it. So we are going to talk about weight regain only. We're going to take talk about weight regain after patients who've had sleeve gastrectomy and a bypass procedure. That bypass procedure is a proximal bypass procedure. I'm not talking about complications. I'm not talking about comorbidities. So simple relapse in weight after a restrictive and a proximal bypass procedure, do you have an algorithm? And why is this the best algorithm you think? So uh, I will start with Pro Professor Mark uh, and then go down the tree and we'll go down to everybody in this audience now. 
Dr. Mark, you might want to please uh, unmute yourself. Can't hear you because you're muted. Okay, first of all, um, weight regain after sleeve. Well, depends, of course, what is the reason of the of the weight regain. But let's say that um, if you have a dilated sleeve or a very large sleeve, we do a re-sleeve. If not, we convert to uh, mostly to MGB with resizing of the sleeve. Um, then what about um, uh, weight regain? You mean after ruin Y? Is that correct? Uh, after ruin Y or uh, MGB with 150 centimeter bypass, which I will include in proximal okay. bypasses for the procedure. Okay, that, the that's procedure. that's absolutely more challenging. Um, anyway, what about um, um, Ruin Y? Uh, you can do um, what we did sometimes is resizing the pouch, sometimes putting a band. And I must say we have well, not too much experience with distalization of, of the bypass. We did a few, but sometimes this leads to um, um, uh, nutritional deficiencies. Um, for uh, MGB, well, if you wait again uh, after MGB, we try to um, lengthen the bypass. But always in that case, we uh, measure the total small bowel length. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Wee Lee. Hey, for sleep weary again, now my favor is SASI because my favorite is primary procedure is still OAGB. But for revision sleep, I find if I leave a small entrance, this is more difficult for me to consider resection or not resect. And I found SASI is a quite good instead option for revision sleeve. I always trim the sleeve tube, repair the hiatus, and put a loop anosmosis on entrance. And up to now, probably two years, I found the result is quite good. And the patient also have a duodenum and passage. So we don't need to worry about uh, anything happen in duodenum. So I personally like this procedure. Then for room Y get your bypass, we regain. I now more like to try endoscope treatment plus medicine. Cause I think revision for this, this kind of, we don't have a good data to showing a uh, outcome for revision. So I personally favor endoscope with medication. And for OAGB, if a patient have a short bypass and we can see a wide gastric pouch, then I will re redo as a standard procedure to make trim the gastric tube and put the bypass more distal if the patient have a, still have a good nutrition profile. Yes, this is my... Uh, sir, I have one comment, uh, Professor. Yes. Yeah, regarding SASI, if you are going to do SASI, and already as you mentioned, you will resize your sleeve. So what will be common channel in, have you any criteria? Are you measure whole length of small bowel? And what will be common channel? Have you any standard for such a cases? Yes. I I always measure small bowel in, in, in every bypass patient. But for SASI, if you want anastomosis on Elian, you need to bypass at least 50% of the bowel. So my principle is I bypass 60% of the small bowel, leave 40% for a SASI procedure. And, but for OAGB, the bypass ratio is reverse. Re reverse. I bypass around 30%, yes. This is a principle of mine. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Vijeli. Uh, I hope that answers your question, Imran. I uh, will move on to Dr. Amir. Thanks. I think uh, it's, uh, I'll answer your question, but then I've got a question which I'm going to put as well to the panel after that. 
As far as uh, weight regain, if there uh, depends on if it's a sleeve, yes, there's always an option. Okay, you could convert that to a bypass. You can look at either do a ruin by or you do a, a one anastomosis bypass, depending upon whatever you are comfortable with. But if the patient has the reflux with that, I won't. I will definitely make a ruin by. I'll correct the hiatus and do a ruin by. Then, as far as uh, your one anastomosis bypass is concerned, I think you've got an option. You can make it uh, longer bypass. Instead of 150, you can go up to 200. But then I think I agree with the panel that we ought to measure the full length of the bowel to make sure we leave enough for absorption and not cause malabsorption. The difficulty comes when it's a ruin Y, because I think with the ruin Y, I've been through the phases of causing restrictions by putting bands and all those. I don't think they work, to be honest with you. You might temporarily do a little bit, but not. I think medical treatment probably is the best option. Uh, you add to it and let it work. My question to the panel would be that someone who had a primary operation, not just a restrictive sleeve, a bypass, and has come back and lost very, did very well, lost weight, came down from 180 to uh, 80 or 90 kilograms or 100 kilograms, but then started putting weight on again. Should we be actually offering them surgery? Because these are the patients who are down the line going to come back to you. And my experience is distalization doesn't work. Yes, by making the biliary limb longer, yes, it does make some, uh, some effect on the patient, but then you end up in a situation of malabsorption as well. So I, I think we need to seriously think about it. Putting complications aside, reflux aside, if a patient is just who's had a very good result with the first operation, comes back with a weight regain, should we be actually offering them surgery? Because here is a patient with a problem, not just the operation. Thanks. Sir, can I add one comment? In this such a case that Professor Amir Khan mentioned, can we go for endoscopic intervention and we can reduce the size of pouch and also gastro In Imran, I have actually looked at uh, in the past, not done even endoscopically, I've done surgically to reduce the size of the stoma. To be honest with you, it doesn't make a huge difference. Uh, yes, you can do it, that you've done a procedure. Similarly, when I talk to the people who are doing endoscopic, uh, uh, making the stoma narrow, I don't think the results are very promising, but I'll leave to the experts. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Amir Khan. I, I think we're coming to a consensus. I see sort of that uh, from Mark, from Vijay, from yourself. Uh, all wisdom is flowing in that once a ruin wife fails, uh, hold your brakes, take it easy. You're probably going barking at the wrong door if you're going to lengthen the limb. It's not going to work. Think about other stuff. Think about what the patient is doing wrong, what you can do right with the patient, use drugs, use other modalities, and give the patient something better. So uh, we'll continue. If I may comment on this, uh, Sim, can I comment? Can I comment on this, please? Yeah. yeah. Well, yes, I agree with Amir. Well, we were in the era where we uh, see, we saw a lot of patients who comes after one anastomosis, uh, after rheumatic bypass is a failure. And we were stuck with what to do with them. And we tried everything from bands to uh, distalization to all the procedures that we all know. Um, and I agree that the, fa the weight regain is very high or the uh, weight loss is uh, sometimes too low. But still, uh, we should uh, talk about the study published by Kelvin Higa, uh, which showed that uh, when we have a toll that is uh, around four meters, then the nutritional deficiencies um, are nearly absent and the access rate loss um, is acceptable. So this is one way to go as the type two distillation where we have a toll of at least four meters. Other than that, uh, I echo what uh, my colleague said about uh, making some restriction with medication will be the best option. But again, 
uh, if the decision is to go for surgery, uh, it should be an expert surgeons and in an expert centers. Thank you. Thank you, Haisam. Uh, Mohammed Karman Sarwa, could your comments please? Uh, for revision uh, after the slip gastrectomy, uh, it depends on the uh, endoscopy and pathologic findings that we need to um, have uh, endoscopic uh, surveillance follow up. For example, for a lesion in the antrum, such as focal intestinal metaplasia or a pancreatic rest. In these situations, I prefer to convert a sleeve to a sleeve plus procedure such as SASI bypass or SASJ bypass. And in these situations, if the patient uh, has a uh, reflux, I prefer convert a sleeve gastrectomy to central procedure to prevent reflux. If uh, endoscopic follow-up is not mandatory in these patients, I prefer OAGB as conversional surgery or ruin by gastric bypass in the present of reflux. For weight regain after one anastomosis gastric bypass, I generally do SAGI, uh, I mean single anastomosis gastroelal bypass. I take down the gastrogenostomy and then anastomose four meter distally to elome. It, uh, it's a, a single anastomose gastroelal bypass. And um, in some situations, I prefer to convert one anastomose gastric bypass to distal room by gastric bypass with a tall four meter, a four meter tall, as uh, Haysam said. For a room by gastric bypass, I prefer um, to do distalization with elongation uh, of BP limb. I mean, sugar man technique. And uh, as mentioned, Haysam, uh, I uh, count. Uh, all of the total ball lengths, and uh, I save a tall about four meter to prevent hypoalbuminemia and other nutritional deficiencies. Thank you very much. Um, again, I, I think we're in concordance with all the other speakers uh, and our experts here. Uh, Professor Alabas, any anything you would do differently? I still uh, agree with uh, all of the panel, and I still also insist that even patients with uh, sleeve re weight regain shouldn't rush them to surgery until we have to do trial with uh, multidisciplinary team, trying to get them into uh, their original success with the help of medication. Because we, in this way, we minimize the number of patients we had to revise if we can manage to get to save some. And I still agree that the most difficult one to do as a revision is the ruin y gastric bypass as the options for uh, further weight loss surgically. Uh, inter international results are poor. And it's essential to guard against being too much aggressive, getting into malnutrition. So if you are going to, to revise it, you have to make sure that you told it at least four meters, whether this is going to achieve weight loss or not, it's, it's not essential, but it's more essential to avoid the disastrous malnutrition. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, excellent point brought up again. Uh, I think there is a question from the audience from Professor Iftikhar about the use of medications. Thank you, Professor Alabas, for addressing that now. Uh, medicines will increasingly play a bigger role, and especially with more effective medicines coming in, not only for weight loss failure, but probably for weight loss augmentation, even starting as early as three months to six months post-operatively in patients who are not losing enough or not on track to give uh, and fix physiology for that. So thank you very much for bringing that. Uh, Dr. Jammu, any comments, any differing views here? Yes. Please, yeah. yeah. Uh, I would like to address that uh, uh, Look, doing revision surgery for all patients who has already undergone bariatric surgery is a very challenging thing. We should understand that. And we have seen the complications of the second surgery after the primary surgery, the leak and other things, and the malnutrition. 
So like one of the speakers said, we should not rush the patient for another surgery. Doing a restrictive, too restrictive surgery, I'm not in favor of much that, unless we have a big hiatus hernia or a dilated sleeve. So I am of the view that uh, if a restriction has failed, I think a procedure should be made more stronger by doing some bypass procedure. And uh, if patient has more of GERD problems, uh, Ruben Y is a choice. And if patient doesn't from, suffer from any GERD problem, I think MGB or IGB is a better choice. Uh, because uh, doing uh, making a tight sleeve uh, will add the chances of uh, sleeve leak. And once the patient has failed one procedure, there's no, no guarantee that they are not going to fail it again. So I would suggest that first of all, we should consult the patient and then probably take the help of some pharmaco drugs which have now come into the market and uh, let the patient uh, use that. And only then we should go in for the revision surgery because we cannot guarantee that if the patient has failed one surgery, he might fail another surgery as well. Thank you very much. Dr. Kular. you seem to be in deep thoughts with the hand on the head, forehead, uh, I think we've got it all wrong. Can you enlighten us on the right way? Where have we gone wrong? Thank you, Dr. Kula. Uh, um, thank you. Uh, to be, see, uh, we understand that what is failing in surgery, we have Large two components, is breaking off. the restriction. Okay. Hello. Sir, we can hear you, please. Little, We're little. good. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Let's see. Is it better now? I, yeah. I think I can stop the video, yeah. Sir, please yeah. start now, yeah. Is it okay? Is it better now? Yeah, it's better. It's not better. Thank you. Okay. Dr. okay. Go ahead. See, we, we need to see what is failing. Is it restriction? Is it malabsorption uh, what I commonly uh, see all others have answered the sa same uh, questions and uh, I agree with you all but in addition to this in my MGP patients like um, in last uh, 15 to 20 years we have uh, more than 7,000 patients and uh, coming with weight regain one simple question you know how much fat you see coming out in the stools we, we give, uh, tell them to do a fat challenge test and then next morning, see, because there is a lot of adaptation uh, in the intestine. So uh, if the patient lost good amount of weight initially and the patient is gaining weight, um, uh, say after 8 to 10 years of surgery, this could be just because of adaptation of the gut. And uh, in such a case, we might have to go in and uh, increase uh, a substantial uh, you know, length of uh, intestine, keeping in view that we have a good common channel in hand. Uh, rest other things about putting restriction on restriction. I, I agree with the Dr. Jammu. Uh, I, I don't see, you know, that working well in my patients. And uh, again, uh, with Ruan uh, I, I agree with you all that we don't have many options uh, to fix the Ruan Y expect, except for, you know, telling them to be on kind of uh, medications. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I see Professor Nasir Sakran joining us. Uh, thank you very much for spending time with us this evening. Can I have your comments? So we're talking about, we gave a scenario, we're talking about weight regain here. And if a patient had a sleeve, there are no complications. They, we're not bringing comorbidities into play. And where do we go from there? Where would you go from there? If a patient had RYGB, where do we go from there? And if we had an OAGB, where do we go from there? Would love to hear your comments, Professor Nasir. Joy, you're muted. You may want to unmute yourself. Sorry about that. Good evening. Thank you. Masa al khair. I am so sorry that uh, I start uh, uh, too late because I, I had uh, today some operations, some complicating, and one of these operations was uh, after sleep. Uh, I, I talk that uh, in all the world now we have about 70% of our operation are redo. 
okay some 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 countries less some of them more but here uh, we have i think more than 18 percent uh, of these 10 percent after uh, uh, lagb and 10 percent after uh, after the sleeve and we we need to 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 help this patient uh, before I, I I ask the patient what 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 the choice what the best choice for him, I need to know everything about what happened what why the region is happened to this patient because the 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 operation or because the patient we you know we are surgeon we don't we all the time we say the patient uh, the problem is the patient not me because some sometimes we choose not the the perfect choice for our patient. Sometimes we perform not the, the operation not good because we are afraid because the sleeve is so 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 wide or something like that. And that's the reason before the before I start, I ask for two tests. I ask for gastroscopy before, and sometimes I ask for upper, upper, upper GI in tests. Why it's good for me? Because I need to know if the if the pouch, if the sleeve is large. Sometimes we forget that, you know, that we don't cut the fundus. And sometimes we see the reflux or a diaphragmatic hernia or hiatal hernia. Because I need to know before everything, because after that, I, I would talk to the patient. Okay, after all the evaluation, we see that you have diaphragmatic hernia. We see not large, but we see unresected fundus, okay? It's not as unresected fundus. And the best option is uh, for you to convert to gastric bypass. I, I will talk after that what kind of gastric bypass. But in this patient, we need to, to operate the diaphragmatic hernia before. We need to resect the unresected fundus. And after that, we can go to ruin Y, I go to ruin why if the patient have severe reflux or Barrett or esophagitis grade three or four, okay? But if the patient don't have reflux and did, didn't suffer from esophagitis grade three or four, I can go to OEGB. Of course, we know that sometimes after sleep, the, the sleep, it's little short. It's not like, you know, it's not like play first time, but Surgeon like us, he, he can uh, resizing. I, I I I hear from Muhammad again that we need to resizing the sleeve because not not every sleeve, but sometimes I said I resect the fundus, I resizing the sleeve, and after that I can convert because to convert to only malabsorptive procedure is not enough. We need combination. We need restrictive with malabsorptive. We need the both. Okay, because. The sleeve is so wide, no restriction there. Okay, but it's not enough for me uh, that I I I I, I pipe us two meter or three meters. I don't know what, but it's not enough because I I saw some patient here that the surgeon he cut the sleeve, and he leave everything. He leave the diaphragmatic hernia. He leave a resected fundus and leave everything. But he cut the, uh, cut where is the the angulus or b below little. And he, he said that he performed perfect OEGB or perfect. And this is another mistake because our patient after that, they can suffer from reflux, by reflux, the, and no weight loss. I have zero weight loss for my patient. This is what I think, I think what we can do. Of course, I said, I choose or, or, or ruin my gastric bypass or uh, I, I, I am or one anastomosis gastric bypass. I am surgeon that, I perform a little sadis because, you know, not, not the technique. The problem here that our patient, they are very problematic patients, no, vit no vitamins, no, 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 they don't take vitamins. They don't take what, they don't come to, to, to visit us, to talk with us. And I, I am afraid with hypocalcemia, hypoalbuminemia, and after that, we saw them patients that they have liver insufficiency or 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 uh, ascites after a sadis. Uh, I perform sadis, you know, if I have common channel minimum minimum 
two and a half to three meters. But if if I can't, I I will I, I will not do that. In re, in revisional surgery, I measured all the all all of the small bowel from the trites to the ileocecal valve, and after that I can choose. If the patient have more than six meters. And I know that I can leave minimum uh, common channel three meters. I can I can do studies uh, or I can do a, a OEGB with more than two meters, two and a half meters. Uh, but sometimes maximum three if the patient can have common channel more than three meters. That's all. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll just attract the last comment before I hand over the mic back to Professor Amir and Imran. Uh, that would be from Dr. Javed. Uh, Dr. Javed, uh, thank you for enthusiastically looking at the camera and owning your camera. <laughs> I got you right there. Uh, if I got you right on focus, please go ahead now. <laughs> thank you, Asim. Um, I'll keep it brief. For okay. sleeve weight regain, if there's a hiatal issue, then I will go for a Ruan Y. Uh, I measure the small bowel completely in all revisional surgeries. <clears throat> Excuse me. And now I've started doing it for primaries as well. So with the tall ratio of 40, 60 or 30, 77, that, with that, I do a Ru and Y if there is a hiatal problem. If no hiatal problem, then I will do a Saadi. And that is becoming more common in our practice. Uh, for Ru and Y gastric bypass, I... Going back for all revisional surgery for weight loss, I always scope them myself and I always do an upper GI to get an idea of the anatomy. Um, if there is a wide, wide GJ anastomosis, I do APC reduction, it takes five minutes. I do two cycles of that. And if with restriction they are better, then we can do a, a overscope suturing. It gives you an idea. It's not a long-term solution. So, and, and with that, we can combine medication and a combination of stoma reduction, simple measure with medication can avoid a lot of redo after gastric bypass. I do can, uh, offer distalization and I follow Calvin Higa's advice and I don't go beyond 300, uh, less than 300 common channel, but I had a mixed result out of that. And Mini bypasses, I don't offer mini bypass as a procedure. Uh, I have uh, looked at uh, converting to Ru and Vi with a, a longer BP limb, but I don't have enough experience to comment on the mini bypass. But th this is my take on the other two procedures. Thank you very much, Dr. Javed. So in consensus, if I may conclude, we all agree that if the sleeve is wide, even if you're converting to uh, RU and Y or OAGB, whichever procedure, there should be some element of restriction, which was brought in by Professor Vijay Lee early. Distalization, the outcomes, as we have all shared, are mixed. Uh, so I think uh, it depends on individual basis, whether you think that that distalization is going to make a difference and more of the effect seems to be coming from the biliopancreatic limbs. So with that, uh, we will come to the conclusion of this session. Thank you very much. And I pass the time back to Professor Amir uh, and Imran. Thank you very much uh, to all the experts who've been here. Your contribution has been valuable in making this session a truly an academic one. Great, thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much, Asim. Very nicely conducted. And thank you very much for all the experts because to be honest, it's a, it's a great learning exercise because uh, uh, it shows we still, we do lots of controversies and we are still trying to work out what's the best way for our patients. I think there is no standard procedure. I think we need to do the right procedure, what that patient needs. Uh, we're going to, I, I'm sure this is quite exhausting to all of us. Let's have about a 10 minutes break and we meet back in about, uh, it's 33 now. So we meet back at about 45, okay? Sir, uh, so, I think, uh, sir, with your permission, can we continue yeah. this session? Because uh, I'm ready but, but, with how do everyone else feel? Let's ask them. Because we, we, are, feel, we, we are already a little late. We are a little late, if possible. Okay, I'm okay for it. Sir, please. Okay, let's move on to our next session. I think we got, again, uh, group of uh, our moderators and experts and uh, 
Look, most of them, it's an opportunity for us at this stage to gain what we can from our experts and try to find some answers to the questions which are asked daily by our patients. Uh, what I'd like to do is, I think, is Atif in or not? I can't see him. No, he's not. So, Javed, can I just request you to introduce the moderators for the next panel, please? Thank you. Sure. Um, you can hear me well? Yes, we can, Javed. Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, Imran, uh, Amir Bhai, and uh, GLR for inviting and arranging this very thought-provoking session. Very important uh, uh, part of our practices, increasingly more frequent um, as to how we deal with patients who had bariatric surgery already. So without further ado, um, I think we have a galaxy of uh, 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 experts uh, from around the globe, uh, starting with Professor uh, Kular from India, uh, Professor Laurent Layani, who was already present in our session and has contributed uh, already, Professor Mark Fokwit, um, Professor Mario Musella, who is a regular contributor to this uh, uh, to our sessions, uh, Professor Osama Yasin Taha, um, uh, great experience. And uh, I hope Professor Rutledge, uh, who does not require any introduction, is uh, available. And uh, uh, great Professor Rui Rubirio, who is, uh, again, a very frequent uh, contributor. Um, uh, Haysom has already been uh, contributing to the previous session. So um, that's the uh, our uh, panel uh, of experts with me, I'm hoping uh, Dr. Atif and Amshami would join us um, as moderator. Uh, Dr. Woyang uh, and Dr. Alexander Neymark. Uh, and, and the last uh, uh, person to moderate would be Dr. Manana Gogol. Um, I welcome you all. And uh, thank you for the contributions uh, already made. And look forward to hearing from your experience and learn from your uh, uh, wisdom. So has Dr. Um, Atif Javed, joined us? As Atif is not there, Dr. Ghulam, Professor Ghulam Sadiq is there. Do you want to take him as a moderator as well? Yes, of, of course. So it's a, it's a great pleasure and honor to have Dr. Ghulam Sadiq, who is a leading bariatric surgeon in Pakistan, recently held a very successful bariatric meeting. Assalamu alaikum, Ghulam Sadiq Saab. I hope uh, you can hear us. Uh, okay. Okay. Do you want to start with the first uh, questions, please? Okay. So I think um, I'll fire the first question and then we'll go around whosoever is available to answer and we'll keep moving. We have got about seven or eight questions uh, in this session. So my first question is, how do you manage surgically a patient? Hold on. Is, did Asim ask this question before? Yeah, ask this question. Think, we can go ahead. Yeah. Park yeah. Okay. Uh, so I'll go to the next question. Then how do you manage uh, GERD after sleeve gastrectomy surgically? So patient, now we are not considering bait only. There's additional complication of GERD after sleeve. And um, I will pose that question to um, Professor Kular, if you're online, please enlighten us with your thoughts on, on this matter. Yeah, thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, for uh, uh, sleeve with uh, GERD, so definitely uh, after, you know, checking if there is a hiatus hernia or it's just a you know, simple GERD, or if it's a, you know, sliding hernia, where is the sleeve situated? So depending on the situation, uh, most likely these patients would go in for uh, Roux and Y gastric bypass. Yes. Thank you. And would you consider um, a one anastomosis gastric bypass if the patient has reflux but does not have a hiatus hernia, is that something you would entertain or no? 
uh, I would preferably go in for uh, Ruan White guesting bypass in such a situation. Uh, sir, can I add one question from Professor Kolar? So, patient with mm -hmm. yield symptoms after sleeve gastrectomy, uh, so patient has symptoms. So, definitely you will go for endoscopy and also are you evaluate uh, uh, like this, uh, uh, so pH metry or manometry or no need, just if there is symptoms, it is sufficient and just you will go gastroscopy and you will change the patient or uh, so convert to Ruan Y. Yeah, in, in my practice, we are not uh, doing uh, pH metry. If the patient is uh, symptomatic, then the uh, patient needs, uh, you know, some kind of uh, pressure lowering procedure. And in, in such a case, we do Ruin Y, but but it's like, uh, you know, MGB-ish kind of Ruin Y. We give them a short rule M and then uh, MGB, yeah. And uh, most of these patients uh, also have some weight regain or insufficient weight weight loss. So that, that works well in such a scenario. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I, I, I hope that uh, Professor Rutledge is online because uh, he may be able to provide us a, a counter view on that. Uh, Professor Rutledge, are you online? Javed, I can't see him. Okay. I don't see. I think he's not there. Yeah. May May I? So th thank you. Um, may I ask anyone on the expert panel who has a different view uh, in terms of the ability to offer a single anastomosis bypass for reflux? If anyone has a view, then can you kindly answer that rather than me going around? Me, 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 well, me, yeah. me. Okay. Me, because <laughs> because for, for, first first of all first of all uh, uh, how are you you I have uh, not seen you uh, for good good for, good to for, see for, you it's, see, it's been a year since, since, <laughs> since uh, our trip in Pakistan listen yes. with all my all my respect to you this question blank the way you 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 presented means uh, uh, you have a patient with a sleeve and your uh, patient has reflux you have to you have to uh, add something extremely important is this patient has any weight regain or insufficient weight weight regain or are we talking about reflux no. disease by full stop so i think we we are talking so, about when weight is not a, recon a consideration only okay reflux. okay 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 so so in this situation because i do a lot of reflux surgery on, on, uh, as a uh, you know not, not bariatric you need to take this patient in consider you need to consider the investigation of this patient as a reflux patient uh, you know, and I know very well that sleeve gastrectomy is a reflexogenic operation. So you need to basically investigate this patient as you investigate this patient when you have a patient coming for reflux, uh, gastroesophageal reflux. I would think, and as you know, doing an endoscopy, doing a, a PM, uh, at least a manometry, if you can do a pH manometry, and, you, you, and perhaps a barium swallow, to see, you, you need to look at the anatomy and the physiology. And be, because, if, 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 you know, sometimes you can even face, I have faced some of these patients which, have, which has been operated elsewhere and present with reflux or, and, and they have some kind of mild achalasia. They have some, some dysmotility disorder. So uh, you have to forget about the obesity Par, 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 parameter and 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 get onto the reflux pure reflux investigation. By the way, Javed, this is a very rare situation. By the way, because what? I tell you why, I tell you why, I tell you why. Because the for some reason, you will find commonly patients presenting with some kind of regurgitation of reflux are the one which has weight regain. No. They, they are almost together. I'm sorry, if I, if no. I may, I have a lot of patients who, yeah. who are in below BMI 30, bad reflux yeah, after yeah, sleep. And, yeah, so yeah, we're talking yeah, about and, that group of patients. 
Yeah, and this situation you'll find more commonly than is an anatomical problem. Half of the sleeve is in the chest, part of the sleeve is in the chest, is a hiatal hernia. And by the way, I think having a hiatal hernia or um, sleeve migration is not an indication for rural gastric bypass. Why would so you what, do that? What would you, so can, can, we, can we sort of, for the sake of uh, simplicity, if there is a hiatus hernia after sleeve with no weight regain, what would you offer? I have tried in the past when I was in Australia to be smart enough to think that I'm going to repair the diaphragm and do whatever I have to do and do nothing else. It doesn't work. Sure. In, unfortunately enough. Unfortunately okay. enough. So yeah. then, then in this situation, you need to think about like the old days when we used to learn the duodenal diversion. And obviously, a roux-wide diversion is the unique way to deal with the reflux issues. But this is a very uncommon situation. What I mm -hmm. see more is the patient with some weight regain? No, no, we, we are not talking about that. I'm sorry, but we're okay. talking so in, about... So in, 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 so in this situation, the unique the unique way is to divert as a rule wire. Yeah, Javed, can I come okay. in? Yes, please. Yeah, I think, uh, uh, Lauren, with due apologies, I think we see quite a few patients who present with reflux and no weight regain. If anything, they've actually lost more weight than what they should have. And that is a problem. Some of them have got hiatus hernia, and some don't. And I think uh, just answering Imran's question, uh, motility studies is not uh, actually accurate in these patients after sleeve. So it probably, yes, you could do it because we all do it, pH motility. But I think a lot of it is symptoms which we need to go on. And I would agree with Laurent on this, that the best option for these patients is not just repairing a hiatus, repair the hiatus, but also do a ruin by gastric bypass. Thank you, Amir. Right? But, uh, but, but, but Javed, this is a very rare situation. Uh, Laurent, I'm sorry, but I've practice. got a lot of patients. Even, yeah, even in, in my practice in Cleveland, I've got a lot of patients. <laughs> so I, I think uh, we, we try but, to... But, but, but I, 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 yeah, it's okay, it's fine. Laurent, let's agree to disagree. Okay. So <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Lauren. <laughs> Sir, I have, uh, uh, sir, I have one comment. Iman? Yeah, sir, Na we have Nasser with us. Nasser is a leading person for uh, MGV, OAGV. Uh, so what is his experience? Maybe he has okay. a idea. Nasser, can okay, you... Dr. Nasser, can, can you please comment on that, on your experience or your angle on that? Nasser, please unmute yourself. Rut Professor Rutledge is here, sir. Professor Rutledge is with us. Okay. So yeah. while while we, Dr. Nasser, are you online? Uh, Professor Rutledge is also live. Okay. With us. Well, why 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 don't we take um, uh, good afternoon or good evening or good morning, Professor Rutledge? Good to see you after a long time. We we were talking about the issue of reflux. I am sorry. I was I was a little out five minutes. Sorry. Okay, okay well, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll take you back in a minute, Dr. Nasser. I'll just uh, let me continue with Dr. Rutledge for the time being. So um, the issue we were talking about is reflux disease after sleeve gastrectomy with no weight regain. Uh, the debate we have is most of the people favor doing a ruin by bypass. We wanted to know if you have a counter view or counter argument. Um, I don't know that I have any great wisdom on the sleeve, so maybe I will comment on reflux after MGB if I have your permission, sir. I'm um, sorry, but this is the topic that we're discussing now. So okay. what, what to do, uh, with apologies, what to do with sleeve gastrectomy patient who comes to your practice with reflux and no weight regain. So what would be your surgical choices? We, we, we have dealt with the investigations and all the other parts. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You know, I have to apologize. I don't believe I have a good comment to offer you. And so I will bow to the next uh, uh, discussant. My apologies. Thank you. Dr. Nasser, could you please comment on that? Yeah, thank you. Again, uh, I, I talked about that before. Maybe I will talk again. 
if the patient suffer from leaf reflux, we don't need to to know how kind uh, what the reflux is, what it's mean. All of us maybe can have esophagitis A or B. For me, this is not the problem. Uh, the problem is, again, if the, if the patient suffered from esophagitis grade C or D, or have Barrett, or if the patient have reflux with huge, not little, huge hiatal hernia. This is the two things that I, 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 I need. Of course, we need to ask the patient about smoking, about if he, he take PPIs, if if the patients take people as a not smoker and they have esophagitis grade C or D or is a hiatal hernia, the fragment is huge or big, I, I will talk him about to convert the patient through in my gastric bypass. If the patient suffered from hiatal hernia little or from esophagitis grade A or B, I can talk uh, with the patient about the two options. The first option is ruin Y. The second option is one anastomosis gastric bypass because the, ruin, the OEGB also it's anti-reflux, but of course we need to have uh, to, to 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 make this procedure a, 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 a the the pouch is must be very very long. After that, he can suffer not from acid reflux, he can suffer from bile reflux. And that's the reason that we can we talk to the patient before about the two options. Thank you very much. Sir, I have um, one comment. I, Sir, can I yes. have one comment? So yes, please. a patient with the GERD after his sleep, is it necessary to check? So there may be there is some, because patient already lost weight, there is no weight regain, only GERD. Maybe there is a, a functional obstruction twist or any uh, this. Uh, uh, so because we have a lot of youngsters uh, who are following us and this will be message. So my question from as well from our expert panel. So what we must do, we must uh, uh, we must uh, uh, rule out any twist or any stricture at uh, in Cicero angularis, then we can decide so which procedure is better? Thank you, Imran. I think that's a very important aspect, especially for our young trainees and surgeons. I think um, different people would have different routines. We always do an upper GI fluoroscopy, which is a video exam of the upper GI tract, and an upper GI endoscopy. So we do these two bare minimum before we do any revisional procedure after sleep, especially if they have reflux. And... Uh, we have to make sure that there is no, not either a functional twist or a stricture, which would then dictate the procedure of choice after that. Um, we have already spoken about hiatus hernia, reflux esophagitis. If there's any other comment from anyone, I would love to hear. Otherwise, I'll move to the next question. Javed? Yes. Uh, uh, Gulam can Zarek, I? Sahab, salam alaikum. Uh, Please. Salam alaikum. Yeah, good, good to hear That's from it. you. Uh, same here. Thank you. Um, Javed, uh, about, I'm not a, an expert on MGBs or OAGB for that matter. But the thing is, uh, uh, in my practice, I have seen so many patients coming up with uh, marginal ulcers and bile reflux uh, after uh, MGB or OAGB. And in a few cases, I have noticed that I, when I converted them, I found that they, the surgeons have made the pouch very short. Uh, it's about six to eight centimeters. And I think uh, for the youngsters, the, 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 the standard teaching should be that if you are uh, uh, contemplating on OAGB, you must make sure that the pouch is at least 14 centimeters, if not uh, uh, more than 20. that. I think 12 to 14 would be a good idea rather than making short pouches, uh, having uh, uh, obviously marginal ulcers, uh, you can't prevent with that, but um, uh, because the more the acid producing area, you are more exposed to uh, uh, marginal ulcers. But uh, if the shorter is the pouch, you are more exposed to bile reflux. Um, so, th thank you very but, much for those very the, valuable sorry, the, comments. Sorry, we the have... marginal ulcer are coming the same 
not only OEGB, the, the marginal thing coming after the ruin Y gastric bypass, some paper, they talk about the after ruin Y, the, the most common, they have more than the OEGB. The problem with the reflux is not it's not the mastomosis. The reflux by reflux, the problem I as I agree with you, some surgeon have short pouch, okay, or the 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 gastro the gastro jejunal anastomosis they, they they make a linear in a not a horizontal horizontal that mean that they have less six centimeters, and they said that the pouch is long, but he don't uh, he don't talk about the anastomosis that he will 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 go up a little. Uh, I Dr. Agree. Nasser, we, sorry, yeah. if 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 I may, uh, I think this is the question further down the line about the technicalities. Uh, if if we can, uh, if, with your permission, if we can stick to our um, the questions that we had agreed on. Uh, now we're talking about the marginal ulcers. Uh, let's talk about that. After ruin by gastric bypass, if there are marginal ulcers, how do you treat that? Or what is your, uh, while, you're, while you're there, can you share your thoughts on treating marginal ulcers after ruin by gastric bypass? And then I'll move to the other panelists. Okay, I, it's for uh, this question for me? Yes. Yeah, okay. Marginal says you start with PPI, the second okay. PPI, the third PPI. The, uh, if you start PPI and you ask the patient to stop with smoking alcohol, 90% of the algal says they can, you can treat it. The 10% that we have problematic patient that they are smoking or a lot of alcohol or technically because we have some ischemia in the anastomosis, the patient can suffer marginal ulcer. The problem is very big because to con to convert to 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 uh, uh, to have another anastomosis, another you can you have re you have you can have new marginal ulcer, you know that that yeah I some patient I convert ruin Y to sleeve or or one anastomosis to sleeve, but after that they can have weight regain. This is one of the biggest problem with with uh, with us the ten percent of our patient that they can. They can have deep or perforated marginal ulcers. Of course, we can have a new anastomosis. If the problem with anastomosis, what's mean? If the anastomosis of ischemia or foreign body, we sometimes, some surgeon, they use a, a unabsorbable suture that they can have, you can have foreign body there. Maybe the re anastomosis it will be okay but thank, thank you very much yeah. yeah so 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 your emphasis is on non-surgical uh, medical therapy Th uh, we got that point thank you dr mark Falkett, can we have some input from you on 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 that please uh, i have one uh, remark about uh, the situation because we speak about uh, reduce surgery, a revisional surgery after uh, sleep. Uh, it's uh, for me. Uh, it's always uh, ruined. Why? And uh, I explain that um, I think then when we transect sleep uh, for MGB, uh, we um, we completely uh, destroy the uh, uh, stomach conduit. If we do ruined Y, uh, we save the stomach conduit with good uh, blood circulation by uh, LDA. Oh, yeah. And uh, it's very important for me, point, uh, because we never know uh, what we will do after. Uh, it, it can be third procedure, or fourth procedure, or maybe we need to do something, I don't know, uh, plastic of esophagus. And in case if we do MGB, uh, it's a little bit um, more difficult than to do some reconstruction. Uh, so you favor y, so we you save the, we, we, we have a big uh, gastric conduit. Thank you very much. So, so your point is that offering ruin Y has the ability to keep uh, the remnant stomach for future uh, considerations. Thank you. Yes. Dr. Mark Forkett, uh, about the marginal ulcer, is there anything yes. else that you would like to add? Thank you. Thank you very much. I have uh, um, not not too much experience with intractable marginal ulcer. 
I suppose intractable means that it is resistant or reluctant to medication. So um, first of all, in this, uh, for these patients, we have to eliminate all negative um, factors like smoking, alcohol, uh, medication, H. pylori, all these things. And then um, if you have ruled out all this, well, and the ulcer isn't healing, I think the only way or the, the only thing you can do is to, uh, to construct a new gastrojejunostomy. That's my opinion. Sure. Uh, you can combine it with a vagotomy, whatever, but it's very difficult to treat. We had one patient and she had uh, uh, was a heavy smoker. She had an intractable margin ulcer. Uh, we asked her to stop. She didn't stop. And then she had a perforation. Then we we uh, construct a new uh, gastro J. She re restarted to smoke. And then we said, okay, there's just for us one uh, solution. That is to um, to convert the gastric bypass into normal anatomy. Sir, I have Thank one you. comment. Professor, I have one yes, comment. Sir, in this interview series session, uh, so I have also two different uh, opinion and also from the big name like Mario. What was the opinion of Mario? Mario will join us. Just he sent me a message. He's in operation room and he will join us. Indefinite, he will uh, also explain about his uh, opinion in such a situation. He is going to do entrectomy, and also what is his uh, uh, opinion? So when we will do entrectomy, then we will decrease the production of gastrin. That is the cause. Yes, already we must rule out and also we exclude all negative factors that already <laughs> Professor Mark and Nasser highlighted. But again, still marginal ulcer is there. Still, there is no response to uh, uh, medical therapy. Yes, after this, and our patient is now, now smoking, nothing, no using, not using NSAIDs. We ruled out everything. But still, there is a, a marginal ulcer in Ruan Y gastric bypass. As Professor Mario hope, he will just now he is going to join us, and we will ask again if someone has any experience and also another our colleague. Uh, same question he responds. He's uh, uh, doing uh, truncal vagotomy. Uh, Helmet Billy, I can also ask the name. Uh, he also mentioned in such a situation, he preferred to go for uh, 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 truncal vagotomy. These were two different opinions during my interview series. If someone has any comment. Um, Imran, you brought some very uh, interesting ideas to the table. Um, okay. I think. Um, I'll, I'll take uh, uh, Amir Bhai's uh, um, comments first, and then I'll uh, just share my thought on it. Sorry, yeah. Thanks, Javed. Uh, Imran, it's, uh, it's uh, these 10% who do not heal with medical treatment, they are a nightmare. And they are very difficult to deal with. You listening? Yeah. I think uh, there are a couple of things. One you on the... On the... <laughs> my God, they do so fucking... Laurent, I'm saying John, me. John, John. Laurent, unmute yourself. Okay, okay, okay. Listen, yeah. what you, you're going to Laurent, say. You, Laurent, can, can you mute yourself, please? Huh? Can you mute because there's. I will a... mute. Okay. Yeah, if, Imran, if you can, please. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think one need to exclude important part. Once you've done all the medical treatment, you stop smoking. I think nowadays, to be honest with you, I. Uh, because marginal ulcer in those 10% patients are such a pain that I've stopped operating on people who still are smokers, even as a first operation. So you need to get all those things sorted out. But you need to exclude a gastrogastric fistula because although you've completely transected the stomach, but sometimes you know where we have divided the stomach and done our anastomosis, that place you can have a fistula as well. And it's not easy to pick up by doing an endoscopy or even a contrast swallow x-rays. The only way you sometimes see it is when you're actually operating on these people again. If there's a marginal ulcer, which is not healing, not responding to any other treatment, and a patient, either it's an ischemic or it's due to fistula, surgery is the next option. And I think you need to go and redo the operation. 
When you go to redo it, that's when you find that fistula and you can treat these people at that time. So I think it's we should not write them off because it's a difficult group and it's not easy to deal with it. Javed, my request from you would be that once we've talked about this marginal ulcer in RYGB, can we move on to a discussion same to move towards MGB and talk about marginal ulcer as well as reflux? Because we've got quite a few experts here of MGB and OAGB. So it'd be a worthwhile discussion. Sure. Thank you very much. I think you, you shared two very important points. I just want to reiterate those. Number one is the gastrogastric fistula, the possibility of that in, in difficult operations, which you cannot demonstrate. And secondly, not offering uh, ruin wire to smokers. And sometimes the patients come and tell you that they've stopped smoking. We now all offer a nicotine blood test. And for any, when they come with intractable ulcers, we check. And if they are positive, we tell them no surgery until you stop smoking. So that is one of the other things which is available. You can do the nicotine test. With that, um, I think we will now move on to the marginal ulcers in mini uh, or one anastomosis gastric bypass and how to treat that. And I would now take Professor Rutledge, who, who's very patiently waiting online. Uh, Professor Rutledge, your thoughts on treating marginal ulcers after one anastomosis or mini gastric bypass. Sir, I'm honored uh, to present. Uh, would I have uh, your permission to share my screen? Certainly, if you uh, can. Yeah. Yes, please. Okay, good. Professor Mario is also with us. One second, and... No. Yeah. So I'd like to report on a uh, large-scale study I'm doing with my friends in uh, Iran, particularly looking at reflux, but also has applications, I think, to marginal ulcer. And so I wanted to point out this kind of paradox in MGB, and I'll be brief about this. That may, may I request that we, we, we would not have 10 minutes for this, if I if you can be brief, if I may request all that. Right, uh, all right, I will go very quickly, and I'll go through. I'm sorry, my apologies. Uh, many of my friends know I always talk too much, so I apologize. I will go quickly and I will just show you a bad anastomosis. So in other words, let's imagine we wonder about marginal ulcers. And we already talked about the two op potentials. One is that uh, there's too much acid, but the other thing is that there's ischemia. And what I would say is in our studies, we found that some surgeons who do MGB have high rates of marginal ulcers and others have low rates. And that seemed to be related to volume of experience. So my bias is that when you are faced with a marginal ulcer, that to remember that uh, with PPIs, there are no ulcers anymore. You and I as surgeons used to do, <clears throat> those of us that are old, used to do ulcer operations. We don't do them anymore because PPIs neutralizes the acid. So that means that the marginal ulcers that occur in our patients, in my opinion, are almost all because of ischemia, and I relate that to the surgical technique at the initial operation. And so I'll briefly stop there and say that ideas of things like um, worrying about whether or not there's a truncal vagotomy, a truncal vagotomy in a, a, an achlorhydric uh, gastric pouch, I don't think will be helpful, and I've had that discussion in the past, but in general, the surgical technique at the initial operation leads to ischemia at this area, and uh, the junction, and so the initial presentation and the initial operation makes a large difference in our uh, large-scale study. Professor, Professor Rutledge, while you are there, can I ask you just for the sake of uh, audience to show us where do you think the best place to place the anastomosis, please? <laughs> yes, sir. Um, let me go right through that. I have a picture of that. Um, can I go, let me go back one. So let me show you where you shouldn't put it, and then we'll say where we put it. Think of this, that we have to have healing of the gastrojejunostomy. We know the vascularity has been eliminated laterally. There is no more greater curvature blood supply. So our blood supply all comes from the lesser curvature. Yes, sir? 
Okay, what that means is that we do a gastrojejunostomy with a staple gun. Let's imagine we can do it here, here, or here. When we do that in the medial aspect, there is a potential of collateral blood supply. If we do a lateral staple line out here, this tissue then has foreign body, foreign body, and potentially dead ischemic tissue here. So my opinion is that when we do the gastrojejunostomy, it's very important to place it. This is a very simplistic answer to your question, but in general, what we need to do is think about the lateral aspect of the gastric pouch that will be in this distance and in this distribution of blood supply. If we make this staple line here, which is obviously avascular, and then we make a staple line here, can make this area in between here for the lifetime of the patient, unresponsive to antacid drugs, et cetera, if we do this at the same time of the surgery. What I mean is that the surgical technique creates the marginal ulcer in many, maybe a large majority, because when we studied it in large scale studies, as well as my own friends that I deal with, we often report low rates of marginal ulcer. Other good honorable surgeons find high rates. My bias is it may be related to the surgical technique, and I'll stop there. Thank you very much. I think that that, that was very um, helpful to understand visually. May I ask you, if, if you come across a patient who has marginal ulcer post-mini bypass, then what would be your algorithm of treating that? given that we are there now with an ulcer. So how would you treat that? I think you said it well. I, I won't go into dietary treatments. I think there's a lot to discuss there. Obviously the medications. And then I would have a high rate of unfortunately being forced to uh, revise the gastrojejunostomy. And uh, depending on what the previous anatomy was, sometimes it would actually, if you face a persistent or deadly complication of marginal ulcers, I would consider undoing or reversing the surgery. Thank you very much. Um, amongst our panel of experts, um, is there a different opinion or is there an additional comment on how to I have treat... a question. Yes. Well, Dr. Rutledge, uh, I have a good experience uh, with anastomosis, uh, hand tune, uh, and uh, we don't have a stapler line that's cross. But uh, anyway, we see the marginal ulcer. It's not maybe so often, but we see. Uh, it's not ischemia in this zone. How you explain this phenomenon? Well, you will forgive me. It's always ischemia because it can't be acid. There is no acid in a tiny gastric pouch on PPI. So that means there is only one thing left, in my opinion, that whether you say there is no ischemia or not, the reason for the marginal ulcer. Why is the marginal ulcer always on the lateral aspect? The lateral aspect is the most ischemic area of the gastrojejunostomy. However you do your suturing, it'd be my humble opinion that the suturing itself, however it is done, uh, my bias, we could look at your videos if you wish sometime, but that is you're making ischemia. And the fact that you have it rarely means that the vast majority of your suture repairs are done well. But sometimes you have an extra bite and you devascularize the lateral aspect. That causes the marginal ulcer. That's why they're always on the lateral aspect. That's my explanation. Thank you very much. I'll bring in Professor Mario here. Professor Mario, are you online now? If not, yes, then yeah. I will... Good, good, good evening from Italy. Well, <laughs> hello, <laughs> welcome. So, so we're talking about the marginal ulcer after mini gastric bypass or OAGB. If you have a patient, yeah. how how would what is your algorithm of treating that? Uh, okay, sure. Uh, well, first of all, uh, I, I believe. And what's this is what we do routinely is to uh, assess an eventual uh, infection from H. pylori before surgery. Uh, we often do this, and uh, uh, we uh, in general uh, prefer to eradicate any H. pylori infection before surgery. Uh, sometimes we do this, sometimes we cannot for um, several reasons. 
And in any case, if we have an ulcer, once again, following an MGB, of course, uh, in these cases, uh, again, we prefer to assess an eventual infection of, from uh, H. pylori. And uh, we use the, the standard eradication protocols we have to, to heal the ulcers in these cases. Uh, I agree with uh, the uh, remarks coming from Dr. Rutledge. Um, probably in most cases is an issue, is an issue related to, to the blood supply. Uh, we have a, 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 an old refrain we, we learned when, when we, we, are, we were young surgeons, and it is the, the stomach forgives you anything because it is so well vascularized that in general it, 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 it keeps any anastomosis you do and soon or mechanical. But sometimes I agree that uh, if, if you have an overlapping of the suture lines, you can have some problem with the blood supply. So coming back to your question, when I have a, a marginal ulcer assessed by GDS, of course, uh, my first line of treatment is a conservative treatment following an algorithm of a protocol, standard protocol for the the ulcer, especially if coming from H. pylori infection. And later, uh, if I have a, a, a sorry, I'm really sorry. We, we, we're talking about once we've exhausted those conservative options, surgically, oh, what, what is it that you would do then? Sure, sure, sure. Well, uh, if the if the uh, ulcer is an intractable and uh, uh, I am at risk of having bleeding or perforation, uh, sometimes my option is, is to convert this surgery to a room y surgery. This is what I normally do. Of Thank course, you very sometimes much. It, it's not sometimes I'm, I I face it um, perforations, of course, and uh, if the perforation is small, sometimes I have I have a good result by just putting some stitches and uh, suturing them. But in general, if I can, I prefer to to convert to a one by option. Thank you, um, <clears throat> Doctor Harrison. Do you have a different view on that? Um, well, um, as far as the uh, uh, ulcer uh, in row gastric bypass, uh, sorry, we, we, we should remember. We, I'm sorry, we're talking we about the, the mini gastric bypass now. Ah, okay, I thought the uh, uh, the question was about the two ulcers in row and the mini bypass. Okay, please, please go ahead <laughs> and comment on both then. Yeah. And just one comment on the row why just remember the a Brazilian study that talked about whenever we have more than 30 cc uh, gastric pouch, then we have a 10% increase with every 10 cc. So, so maybe the size of the pouch is very important in row Y. Added to this, uh, they talked the uh, my colleagues about the uh, alcohol and uh, uh, and smoking and Helicobacter pylori and uh, for one anastomosis. Uh, uh, I agree with Dr. Rutledge that one of the pathophysiology of the uh, marginal ulcers is ischemia, but um, uh, it is not uh, only the uh, the ischemia. We saw it in uh, in a lot of patients where uh, who uh, who are smokers, uh, and we don't see it in non-smokers. So how we can explain? The uh, uh, the presence of ulcers in uh, in uh, in all these patients. So my approach for the for this is, as Dr. Nusela said, first eradication of H. pylori, second PPI, third sacral phage gel or or something like that. If if patient did not respond, then I convert to room or gastric bypass. David, and, can I just ask a question here? Uh, yes, sure. No. We know from the studies that if the pouch is large, especially if it's more than 50 cc, people will talk about it as a mistake as a number, there is a higher incidence of ulcerations, right? As compared to shorter pouches. So if you are converting an OAGB or MGB just to who and why, you still have a longer pouch and it's larger than 50 cc. So aren't we actually exposing these patients more to form ulcerations rather than actually curing them? That's an excellent question. So I'll go back to 
my panelists who are proposing to convert to Ru and Y. So would you make a small Ru and Y pouch in that conversion or would you simply exclude the ulcer and just do the Ru and Y reconstruction on a bigger pouch? So Haysom, can I go back to you on that uh, question, please? Uh, well, I think this is a very good question. And what I, I, I converted like three or four patients and uh, it was really not the real gastric bypass that we do uh, normally, but it was a bit longer. So I agree I may have uh, more ulcers later on, but this is my practice. It was not really as a, the super small pouch of the room OY. It was a bit longer. So I think the, uh, on this forum, we, we get ideas and questions from people with huge experience. And I think that is one of the benefits that I see that even our practices, established practices may evolve and get better by learning from each other. I'll go back to Professor Mario uh, with the same comment about the size of the ruin Y pouch after conversion from uh, mini gastric bypass. Well, in my opinion, uh, if you if you convert a surgery to another, you you should try to to do the the technique as close as the original description it is. So, uh, if you convert to a one Y, you are making another surgery, but basically, so I make a small pouch and uh, excluding. Uh, I would say 80 to 90 centimeters, uh, one meter of common channel and the same for the BP limb. So you're moving from a surgery to another, um, just not excluding the ulcer. That's what I do normally. So and on that, if I may ask a supplementary question, sure. um, the ulcer may be an obvious pathology a lot of these patients will have reflux. And when you're converting it, would you always look at the hiatus very carefully to repair it at the same time, even if it was not a documented hiatus hernia? Well, it depends on what I have uh, uh, on pre-op EGDS. Uh, it's important. Uh, if, if, if the EGDS is confirming me uh, I have uh, a, a medium-sized hiatal hernia. Uh, I believe this is the case to wait to 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 open the the the, the hiatus and see what what's the situation. Uh, conversely, if the preoperative EGDS says uh, that there, there is no hiatal hernia, uh, probably uh, making a small pouch and uh, reconstructing according to one why. It's uh, an anti-reflux procedure per, per se. I mean, it's, it's already an anti-reflux surgery, the one why. So uh, I, I rely a lot o, o, on what the EGDS says to me before surgery. Thank you. Dr. Ja Manana, can I take your... So, sorry, Amir, please. Sorry. Ja can I go back to Professor Rutledge, ask him mm -hmm. a question that, uh, yes, done everything. you got a patient in front of you who has got this ulcer and has got reflux. What, what is your, do you convert it to just straightforward ruin Y or do you go and do a pouch as well? Or do you do something different? Uh, you're not gonna like this, but we do what's called an uncut rue. So can you elaborate on that, Professor? <laughs> yes. Um, post rue and Y, there's a moderate incidence of rue stasis syndrome. And uh, basically an uncut rue takes only a few minutes. Um, you have to worry if you have an ischemic uh, marginal ulcer that you have to redo the gastrojejunostomy. But in general, we don't touch the pouch. Don't worry about the pouch. All we do is we do a, a brawn side to side, and we do a stapled uh, uncut division of the afferent limb into the gastrojejunostomy. And uh, it's called an uncut rue. It's uh, been well studied. I find that many of my bariatric surgeon colleagues are unfamiliar with the data. But uh, it's very, uh, it's almost a trivial operation compared to dissecting the EG junction, et cetera. So that's my suggestion. And I apologize for uh, saying something different. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, no, uh, if, if I've understood it correctly, what you're saying is if there's marginal ulcer after mini gastric bypass, you would not excise that part and you'll do a 
jejuno uh, jejunostomy side to side in in simple terms is that not exactly no correctly? if you have if you have a perforated or persistent marginal ulcer that's uncontrolled that is my opinion is going to be always ischemic and needs to be revised okay. so but then so you would excise that, that yeah, so then you excise it, but I don't want to dissect by the EG junction. I don't want to do any of that stuff. So I, I excise that, then complete the, a, a healthy gastrojejunostomy. Now you have an MGB. So what you want to do then, of course, is prevent reflux and marginal ulceration, et cetera. So you do what's called an uncut roux. So you do a brawn, which takes, you know, five, 10 minutes. And then you do a non-cutting stapler proximal to the afferent limb. And uh, that's called an uncut roux. And, uh, uh, Maybe the rest of the team here is not familiar with it, but there's a lot of research on it. It's very easy to do. And fortunately, we rarely have to do it because marginal ulcers are uncommon, depending on, in my opinion, surgical technique. But I recommend it for you to look it up a bit and, and see what you think. Sir, I this is, what we, this I is what we used to do for repos. Yeah. Sir, the, sir, I have uh, one comment. I think I think the brown anastomosis is not treat it's not treat the marginal ulcer. It's not for marginal. Sorry. No, no, no. The this brown, the, the said, brown anastomosis is for by reflux, but not for marginal ulcer. The second, it's, no, it's it very bad. That, I, it's thinking. very bad idea to 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 do the pay for the patient brown. It's not ten percent. It's more, and the patient they can have a lot of difficult. Okay, I, 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 I think we must, be, I, we must be careful, Dr. Radis, we must be careful to talk about brown if the patient have marginal ulcer. I'm no, very sorry, I, I apologize, I, I withdraw my that. comments. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you, thank you for all the valuable comments from yeah. everyone. Sir, I, I was just going to take... Sir, I want yes, Imran, please. Just one yeah. comment, because uh, Ricard, this is very important, as uh, uh, Nasser, uh, highlighted because this marginal ulcer after MGB and reflux after MGB is two total different things. If there is marginal ulcer, most probably this marginal ulcer is acid-based and on jejunal side, if we will go to like do Rui, Rui and why that Rui is doing now, just cut that efferent and doing Jejuno jejunostomy, that will be again same issue because we cannot resolve marginal ulcer with long pouch roux and why? Because again, acid production is there. Same issue is there. Yes, for reflux, we can talk about brown or uh, uh, that Rui procedure. But for marginal ulcer, that is intractable marginal ulcer, the most probably acid based. What we must do? I think Mario want to talk about this. Uh, if I can add a, a provocation to to this panel of friends, I see a lot of friends today, and uh, I'd like to add to what my friend Nasser was saying. The brown procedure is not good for the marginal ulcers, but for the bad reflux neither. I mean, it has been proven that making a brown anastomosis in patients with OHB and suffering from bad reflux they uh, have a very poor benef benefit from a, a, having a brown anastomosis because the reflux uh, goes on. Uh, finally, uh, what is a brown anastomosis? Which is the difference within brown anastomosis and why? It's just cutting the afferent limb between the two anastomoses. So I believe that the brown anastomosis, uh, I'm sorry, Dr. Rutledge, <laughs> We're saying this, but uh, I I'm not sure that it's a, a good solu solution for the for treating the reflux in the case you have one following an MGB. So we'll we'll accept these different views from experts in their own rights, uh, and it's very valuable for for all of uh, the uh, audience and listeners. I would, I'd like to take a comment for Dr. Marana about the uh, marginal ulcers um, in um, minigastric bypass. Dr. Manana, Google. <laughs> Hello, once again. Um, yeah, um, in my opinion, uh, when uh, there are just the uh, all conservative way, just uh, um, not helping, uh, then of course uh, 
we decide to operate. Uh, just uh, what is in my practice? Uh, this is converting to rule and why. Um, so, um, uh, okay. Th 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 thank you very much. Abid, That's I, uh, it's just uh, what I have to say now um, with uh, this um, all uh, grant uh, in front of these grand uh, names and uh, dear professors uh, to just um, save my opinion. It's just re really biggest honor, just, uh, but again, uh, just what I face in few cases, because I have uh, to compare all of you, just uh, really, re just- uh, Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Marana, for your, and, for your David, contribution. Can I just, can I just, for the um, sake of audience, give one comment here? And uh, think... this is really sorry. galaxy of this, uh, sorry, Dr. Uh, Ma Professor Amir Khan. Do Dr. Manana, thank you very much for your comment. We'll, Sir, we'll Prof take, Prof uh, uh, Professor Kolar is also... Yeah, just uh, before he comes in, just, just sure. a quick comment. I think Kolar uh, is very impatiently waiting to come in. So uh, can I ju just suggest, I think to me it looks like, uh, just for the sake of uh, people who have not dealt that much with marginal ulcers, if you are ended up with that position uh, situation, I think it's very important not just diverting the flow, I think you need to look after the pouch as well and make sure okay, you deal with that as well at the same time. Because you cannot, OAGB and GP <clears throat> pouches are much bigger to convert just to ruin by. I think we ought to look after that side as well. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you uh, we'll, we'll, we'll take a comment for Dr. Kolar now. Uh, yes, sir. So, uh, this is a uh, you know big 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 uh, misunderstanding uh, and a controversy as well in my practice of uh, about two decades uh, of mini gastric bypass initially i would also convert uh, a marginal ulcer which is intractable uh, to ruin y uh, but primarily that is coming from the stigma of uh, the bile flux actually causing the marginal ulcers in mini gastric bypass. But like Dr. Imran also pointed out, in mini gastric bypass, these ulcers are actually the same. It's the same acid peptic disease. So if you are converting MGB to ruin Y just for the sake of treating an intractable ulcer, uh, which I I have landed up into trouble in two cases. Uh, after ruin Y, patient again had intractable ulcer. And we know that uh, intractable ulcer with ruin Y is a kind of uh, much more difficult situation than having intractable ulcer in MGB. So I would like to redo the gastrogenostomy if there is reflux. Then, yeah, then you can either do ruin Y or I would better do the uncut true Y, like Rutley said. We have actually jointly, you know, done this practice for more than a decade and we have seen good results in this. Uh, because converting MGB to a short pouch ruin Y, just for the sake of intractable ulcer, means, uh, uh, you know, we are burning our food. Yeah, that, that's the point which I wanted to raise. Thank you. Uh, thank um, you very much. Uh... So, um, we, um, I, I just want to uh, ask a supplementary question on this. You're, you're managing an, a mini bypass ulcer. You go in and you find the pouch is 10 centimeter. So, you, you have to resect the anastomosis and you're left with, let's say, 8 centimeter of the pouch now, would you still consider keeping a configuration of a mini gastric bypass uh, with a side-to-side -side J anastomosis, or would you at this stage resort to a Ruin Y? Or, or you would still, uh, so, Dr. Ratlis, yeah. a quick comment? Yeah, and I apologize for causing these problems. I think that we can just say what most people want me to say, which is let's do Ruin Y. I would say that there is a new operation that's about 10, 20 years old. It's called the Uncut Rue. 
and you get the benefits of a RU and Y. Uh, you don't have to dissect the EG junction. You don't have to do uh, other treatment. And basically what it is, is first of all, you do a side to side and then you interfere, you divide, you don't actually cut, but you disconnect the afferent from the uh, gastrojejunostomy. And it takes only a few minutes and you have treated the disease. Now, if there is significant um, ischemia, then you revise the gastrojejunostomy, but it's a much simpler, quicker operation. And eight, 10, 12, six, whatever centimeters makes no difference for the uncut roux. So, and I don't, I'm not advocating everybody change your practice. I wanted to say most everyone was saying one thing and uh, my job is always to say something incendiary to get everybody upset. So I hope I've done that. <laughs> okay. Any any comments from any other panelists on this uh, topic before we move to the next question? Mario. Javed, can I? Uh, yes. Ulam uh, Sidi. Yes, please. please. Uh, in my experience, I have seen after Rue and Y, uh, a few marginal ulcers, but two of them presented with perforation. And both of them had a combination of alcohol and smoking. Is that something that anybody else witnessed for perforated ulcers, that they are heavy <clears throat> smokers and at the same time drink alcohol as well? Or no. is it just coincidence? We know that non steroidal anti-inflammatories and smoking is, is the very bad combination for um, ulcers. I'm sure alcohol will add to, to that list if, if someone has that experience please share may i say something yeah i have a lot of experience with <laughs> alcoholic <Me too>. patients <laughs> from punjab dr kular has a lot of experience with alcohol <laughs> yes dr kular like, no, no, what are no, you no. admitting here now <laughs> it doesn't make any difference <laughs> i have a lot of experience with huge amounts of alcohol you know patients taking before surgery after surgery as well even after de addiction, they again start, and we have patients taking one bottle, two bottles. But but the good thing in Punjab is uh, that uh, cigarette smoking is uh, actually kind of a very rare event because if you see a Punjabi with a turban on the head, he would not smoke because of religious reasons. So uh, and because of the same same reason, I see. The ulcer incidence in my series is uh, very small, even less than 1% actually now, if I look two decades down the line. But uh, uh, ulcers in alcoholics who are not smoking, um, I don't see any, any extra incidence in alcoholics who are not smoking. Thank you. Thank you. So, so alcohol on its own is not usually contributory to marginal ulcers. That's uh, that's what Dr. Kula's uh, patient uh, cohort tells us. Thank you for sharing yes. that. The, uh, there was a hand up from Alexander. Um, I just wanted to comment about that because in India, it's interesting that they have uh, alcohol, uh, also alcohol uh, defend patient. It's just very news for me. Because I awaited this maybe from Professor Lauren uh, Leiani from France, but not from Indian doctor. <laughs> you, you you don't know Punjab then? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Doctor Kolar, yes. Maybe uh, not. They are, they are much worse than France. <laughs> they, are like you, they are like you in Georgia. Come to Punjab. <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> thank, thank, thank you, you Lauren. Dr. Alexander, you have a comment? I'm sorry, you're Are muted. You? You're muted, Dr. Alexander. Yes. Sorry, we still can't hear you. But Javed, I just want to con conclude with one small thing. Dr. Ratlesh is right. Ulcer <laughs> after MGB. No, 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 you know how much I love you, Baba. But it's all related to ischemia. Because as much as I, I mean, Javed, the truth of the matter is you're talking about conditions and situations 
which I cannot see in, at all. So the, the it, question is... Lauren, it looks Kenya like you and I practice in... It, I think you and I practice <laughs> in different countries almost. <laughs> no, 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 different country, different style. <laughs> yes, I think we, 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 we agree to disagree on some things. Um, no, and I, I, think... I, I do agree with you. But what I think is Ratlesh is right. After mini gastric bypass, <laughs> this is related to ischemia. It's for sure. And bad okay, technique. So, so I think I can, you're going to have to run while you're also, yeah. It's I, the same as Mario is, is invited me to talk about this gastro judge in, in if so. I did a lot of research and my talk is ready. And uh, it is uh, very much related to technique. And I said, uh, Robert, and I mean, Robert Ratlesh, He's very, very much right on that. Yes, okay, sir. we yes. we we take that point. We take that point, and yes. I think the, 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 I am right the, the, once every twenty years. <laughs> <laughs> so to, to, today no, is your day, no. then, Doctor Rutledge. <laughs> no, no, no. I I disagree with you a lot, but on that point, you're very much right, sir. Professor okay. Mario is also asking question. I think. Yes, yeah, well, I, I just wanted I just wanted to point it out that we are in any case talking about a problem that is reported being from one to two percent in most series. I, I would say we are discussing about doing this, doing that, but we are talking about something that happens in my experience is around one point eight percent and in most series. So it's a minor problem, I would say. Uh, much less common than what we can see in following a one wide gastric bypass. So it's that's so rare. that is my comment. Hello, Mario. Thank, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much. I think with that, that's uh, I'll take that opportunity now to leave this topic and move on to the next question, which is: Have you faced severe weight loss and micronutrient deficiencies after bariatric surgery? If so, how did you solve it by surgical intervention? So we are talking about, now we can talk first about, let's say mini bypass. We are on mini bypass or OAGB. If you have a patient who has uh, severe weight loss or uh, severe uh, micronutrient deficiency, how do you approach this patient? So um, while, while, while you're there, uh, let's, uh, let's start with you, Lauren. Just your algorithm well, on that. Well, first of all, this is a very rare situation, and this situation can occur. And and to me, it's very simple. Is why I, I love MGB so much. Is because you reverse it. Don't okay. wait to reverse so, when the patient's got big legs and fat legs and hypoalbuminemia. It is very rare. In fact, in my own pri private patient patients since I've been working. I have not reversed any of mine. I reversed some of mine in France. Just reverse them. Thank you. I will get that point. Doctor, uh, Professor Mario, would you have a same view or different oh, view? Yes, basically the same. If you have explored all the conservative uh, um, opportunities you have uh, uh, about nutrition, parenteral nutrition or whatever, you, you must bring your patient to the OR and re reverse your exactly. surgery by exploring of course uh, how much how much common channel you have left and uh, well of course and en enlarging your your common channel if it is short and with this regard i'd like to there, there's a, there's been a lot of discussion i don't see our friends miguel carvajo here but uh, um, how much uh, a small bowel should you bypass when you do an MGB? Uh, there's people saying 150, 180, two meters, two and a half, uh, three meters, four meters. I believe there's no fixed rule. Uh, what I do is, uh, well, uh, follow the uh, the BMI of the patient. Uh, the higher the BMI is, the longer is my is my bypass channel but also before doing the anastomosis uh, check always you have at least three meters below the point you are going to do the anastomosis this makes you uh this put you in in safe i mean uh, you and your patient 
But coming back to your questions, uh, if, if, if it is the case, bring your patient to the OR and revise your surgery. Okay, um, Dr. Nasser, th thank you, Professor Mario. I think it's very interesting questions because we we have sometimes, maybe some surgeons that don't have, but we have sometimes, I have sometimes, a, we must be very careful because if we don't do nothing, that this patient can die. We have some cases here. First of all, we can't convert the patient. We need to put it the patient a TPN, nothing for TPN for two, three months. After, because if the patient, I, okay, I think that Radley don't agree with me, but uh, let me uh, let me say what I want to say because uh, because uh, if the patient have hypoalbuminemia with ascites and sometimes they have insufficient of, of the of the liver, I can't operate this patient. Maybe you can, but I can't. Before I need to have a. a, 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 a to put the patient in TPN because I need the, the, the uh, sometimes the albumin is albumin, it's it's less than two. I need to have three or more. After two or three months, I I, I, I can I can take the patient to the operating room. The best option, I agree with the, the my friends, it's to to to, to convert to, to normal anatomy. But some say them, but if I have time and I can put the patient in TPN. And the patient said to me, "Please, I I don't I I I want to be, uh, I I want to be uh, I don't want to be again fat or obese. Please, you can call me convert me to another options. And here I this is the the uh, the advantage of the TPN that after that I can I can go to ruin why or shortening the bilopancreatic limb or to convert the to sleep. But I know it's it's possible." Uh, this is what, uh, this option what I can. Before that, I can't take the patient to the operating room definitely. Thank you very much. I think the important point is the nutritional um, and micronutrient correction before the surgical intervention because some of these patients can be very sick. We, um, we have a liver transplant unit in, in my hospital and unfortunately, I see... Uh, liver failure, requiring liver transplant, post-bariatic surgery, and hence the insight of Dr. Rutledge, you may not agree, but this is this is the experience because no, we are the it's referral true, center. True. And, and, and I think uh, we need to make sure that the message that we give out as, as bariatric surgeon to our trainees about the possible risks of our interventions uh, Dr. Ghulam Sadiq, I remember you had a case, a uh, similar case. Would you like to share your thoughts on that? Um, thank you, Javed. I had, in fact, two cases. Um, one was the one I mentioned it to you at some stage. And there was another young lady. She was operated in the West somewhere. And uh, she had a starting weight of 106 kgs. Uh, then she had intractable diarrhea. She would go to the toilet after every meal or whatever she would eat, she would go to the toilet. So she ended up with severe malabsorption and malnutrition, obviously. When I saw her, her weight was 53 kgs, and that was within a span of eight months. We... Uh, decided to take her for diagnostic laparoscopy. And uh, what we found was that her common channel was 120 centimeters only. And uh, this was the ruin by gastric bypass she has had. And the um, rule limb was two meters. And I don't remember exactly the BP limb, which was two and a half meters or something like that. So I had I had a good chat with this patient preoperatively. I, and I told her, listen, we have to restore the anatomy. Uh, but she said, no, she doesn't want to go back to that 106 kgs again. Then I said, and I discussed with a few of my colleagues that we would go for a standard Roux-en-Y gastric bypass. And I told her, I'm going to keep the, 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 the BP limb short. And uh, I think the total bypass was less than 
uh, 150 centimeters uh, combined, including the Rue and the uh, BP limb. Uh, Postoperatively, she did well in terms of malabsorption, her bowel habits and things improved. But this is almost a year and a half now. She has only put on four to six kgs in weight. Uh, so I'm a bit disappointed with the outcome. I thought she would go up to uh, maybe 70 kgs. Now, the other uh, case was uh, uh, the one I did a ruin by gastric bypass and the patient didn't have a NASH. Uh, that patient, um, uh, I learned some lessons from uh, that patient's outcome because uh, eight months later, her liver function tests started um, uh, getting uh, worsen. And uh, at the same time, she had a little ascites. Uh, she started attending the gastroenterologists, and then she had some renal problems. I told her, uh, listen, we this is the time, right time now uh, to reverse the procedure. Then they were discussing uh, the options of liver transplant. But till this date, with conservative management, they are sort of okay. -ish. So these were the two cases which I thought I should mention it to you and would like your thank comments. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Th thank you, Fasher. Before I go to my next uh, uh, panelist, I'll ask comments from um, uh, Amir Bhai. Amir Bhai, any, um, any thoughts on that malnutrition and, and excessive weight loss issue? I think, Javed, uh, over the years, yes, I've had patients who've come back with the malnutrition. And I think there was a very important point made earlier that we need to make sure that the nutritional state is put right before you go into these patients. And some of them, to be honest with you, the only option is reversal, that you reverse them and put the anatomy back because that's the only way they'll get, get the weight back. Otherwise, you will lose these patients. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Professor, Kular, Professor Kular has... Yeah, uh, I I just wanted to share my experience. Um, uh, the patient was put on waiting list for uh, liver transplant after having lost 80 kilos in six months with uh, 250 centimeters bypass after MGB. And uh, discussing with the gastroenterologist, you know, they, they wanted... They, they wanted to take that patient up for transplant only. And in the meantime, bilirubin started going up and eventually it went up to 19 and patient was drowsy, kind of, mm -hmm. uh, you know, going into, almost going into coma, pre-coma kind of stage. And uh, that is when the family decided uh, to come back to me and agreed for uh, reversal. And uh, we did reverse that case. And uh, even after 15 years now, that patient is living a healthy life without uh, transplant. So I just wanted to emphasize that uh, uh, a very long bypass, we, we know sometimes, uh, you know, uh, too much, too fast weight loss, it, it can put the patient into mal malnourished uh, kind of uh, state. And that, that can enhance the... Uh, poor liver, you know, which is which was already compromised and uh, have uh, Nash. Th and, th and so thank you very much. Uh, reversal is uh, reversal is the only option. And uh, about building up these patients, we have a different view. Uh, if uh, rather than putting them on TPN, you can go in and uh, uh, do a gastrostomy. Uh, that, that's even better, and then you can repair them faster. But we uh, right away take them down even if the uh, albumin is like 1.5 or even one because gastro gastrostomy actually almost rarely leaks so uh, having a gastrostomy or a feeding genostomy that has got more chances of leakage rather than putting the stomach back to stomach that's what we have seen in our practice thank you javed can thank i just you. if i may point G uh, Amir, bhai, please, please go, go ahead. ahead because when we talk about measurement of the bowel a lot of us use different ways. If you remember, there was one video put in by Atif a long time ago. 
because it depends because none of us, I think some, there might be some who are using actual proper measurements, but majority of us go by five centimeter, 10, 15, 20. And that measurement of five centimeter is not always the same. Yours and mine might be different. So I think we need to be a bit careful with that when we talk about uh, 200 to 20 centimeter bypasses. That's that's very doctor, um, uh, useful doctor, piece of information, Javed. Uh, that yes. that's a very that's a very important point. What I have started recently after seeing a few videos, I put steady strips on my bowel graspers, both on the right and on the left, and uh, I measure the bowel uh, with that. And as you mentioned in the beginning, I have started measuring. A small total small bowel length even with my primary procedures yeah i think that is thank you for sharing that i think uh, i started about a year ago um, i give bascopan pre-op so that the spasm goes out and i have the uh, my graspers which have uh, five and ten centimeter marked on them so i think that at least in my mind that's the standardization i um I would like to take comment from Dr. Rutledge on the uh, the malnutrition and reversal issue, please. You're not going to like it. Okay. First of all, it's not short bowel syndrome. I can't go through all of it, but we have seen these same reported outcomes of Bill Roth twos up to 10, 20, 30, and 40, and 50 years ago. That is, the Bill Roth two can result in malnutrition. Uh, diarrhea, B12 deficiencies. And what we all remember, I hope from our distant education, is this is called the blind loop syndrome or the afferent limb syndrome. And what we know is if that progresses, those patients can get severe malnutrition and rarely even death. Now we don't see that very much anymore because we don't do that ulcer operation. So what we should remember is that it's not short bowel syndrome. Now, the second thing is that how it is, the, why is it some patients who have a longer bypass have more risk? Well, the interesting thing is it's dietary first. So in other words, what we know is now is that the underlying explanation of blind loop syndrome or afferent limb syndrome is it is a bacterial overgrowth syndrome. And so dietary choices or being uh, infected with a, a, a variety of bacteria can lead to this development postoperatively. So the treatment should be as follows, and I apologize, this is gonna be very brief. I have a long discussion and many slides on it, but in short, step number one is to review dietary choices, recent international travel, and whether or not there might be a secondary infection. And sometimes simply changing diet to having a high fiber, healthier diet will resolve the issue. Second is oral antibiotics. And so a variety of antibiotics for the anaerobes that can often be related to this, like C. diff type uh, infections can be the second choice. And the third choice, you should never allow your patient to get so sick that they're being considered for liver transplant. In my humble opinion, which is frequently wrong, and you may disagree, is that's mismanagement and can lead to death. And I've been consulted about these kinds of patients all around the world. Basically, whatever the albumin is, however sick they are, don't let them get sick, operate early, and take down of a gastrojejunostomy and reconnection with an MGB takes 20 to 30 minutes, and that's the first step. In addition, if you want, you can add a or gastrostomy, feeding gastrostomy. I haven't done that, but Dr. Kular's patient that he just discussed, I consulted with him. That was several years ago, and I recently saw that surgeon in a consultation in presentation in Dubai, and uh, he has reported that patient is doing well 10 years later. In short, quick summary. Thank I'm sorry. Okay, I'm Thank done. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you, Dr. Atlas, for your very useful insight. Uh, Dr. Haysom, would you like to comment on that? Uh, yes. Uh, well, first, I think it is very important for us as surgeons uh, to see uh, our patients if they are from the low socioeconomic the patients, there are some patients who cannot even buy vegetables. So uh, I don't know if it is really wise for these patients to go for uh, for a malabsorptive procedure. This is number one. Number two, uh, I have personally uh, one death from liver failure, and I reverted three patients for uh, severe mal malnutrition. But, but this was in the era where we used to do 200, 250 centimeters 
uh, I mean before 2018, but since 2018 when I changed my BP limb length to uh, 180 and 160 for female and male, then I didn't have any uh, patient with malnutrition or uh, liver failure. I agree with Robert concerning the uh, bacterial overgrowth, uh, but I think we should emphasize uh, to have a consensus on using a shorter BP length since it is safe. Otherwise, the surgeons worldwide, everyone will choose his BP limb length and then we'll, we'll have a lot of troubles with one anastomosis. Th thank you very much. I think we're coming to the uh, end of our allocated time. I'll just make one comment and then I'll invite comment from Amir Saab and then uh, hand over to uh, um, to our uh, 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 Imran Abbas to, to conclude this. So my comment uh, briefly is a lot of young surgeons listening to this. Please don't go and do these surgeries yourself for a patient who's this sick. Um, get someone with more experience in a center that has more experience to treat and different modalities. So don't conclude from our discussion that you should go and do this surgery just because you can do it. It needs experience and backup uh, and, and some wisdom. Uh, with that, I'll, I'll leave that thought. Um, I pass on to uh, uh, Dr. Amir Khan to uh, give the concluding remarks, please. Uh, Javed, thank you very much. Uh, I must thank all the participants. It's been a fantastic discussion. I've learned a lot from it, and I'm sure my colleagues and the people who've been watching will learn as well. It's going. It, this will go into the library, and people will be able to see it later on as well. Uh, I think Imran has got some ideas about uh, doing, uh, getting some papers written on it, and come up with some sort of a guidelines how to decide about. Uh, uh, re redo surgery and what sort of investigations and how to proceed with it. Imran, as a CEO of GLR, do you want to please do a concluding remarks? Thanks. Uh, sorry, Imran, just before, Imran, just before, I just want to apologize if I've offended anyone by cutting through their discussion. They're very highly esteemed, experienced, valuable colleagues and senior colleagues around the globe. So if I've done something, I apologize for that, but you're all we very highly respected. You, we love Thank you, you, we love you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Imran, please. Sir, so hi, much hi, thanks. How are you? <laughs> yeah. Sir, so much thanks. Really, it was one of the best sessions, no doubt. And this is the need, in my opinion, this is the time to discuss about revisional bariatric surgery. And due to this, uh, so at the platform of GLR and with the help of uh, you all of you, because without your help, uh, this was not possible. And also uh, during this six month, we did 16 interviews with the best of the globe who are the best, especially in revisional bariatric surgery, no doubt. And this is the time uh, to guideline and also standardize. I know it will take time. It's much difficult to standardize but one person must start. And already I have talked with uh, Professor Kirman Saravi, who will lead us and we will try our best. Uh, so especially this discussion, just now today we discussed 13 questions, just now today. And also as you all are as a participant, as a uh, expert panel, uh, and also your views definite already recorded your videos and we will try our best. So much thanks, really. And uh, we need your support always. And with your support and with your guidance, uh, we will go ahead. So special thanks from all expert panel moderators, uh, Professor Amir Khan, who is a leading person and under his leadership. So we will go ahead. Sir Amir Khan. Thank, Thank you very much, everyone. And enjoy the rest of the day, what's left over or the night. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thanks. Thanks so much. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. Thank Thank you. you. Bye bye, Habibi. <laughs> bye, bye bye, everyone. <laughs> bye. Yeah, see, man, you I love you. So. bye, -bye. See, you, see you all in If So or in uh, or in Oxford, one of the two. Yeah, man, I love you. I see you in <laughs> Capri Island. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. For the rich and famous. Have a nice time, sir. Thank you, sir. Thanks. Bye.
יאללה, יאללה, חביבי. תודה. Hey.